Oh, that's why. They're having mic problems. Hi. <laughs> I just got a check for five dollars. Yeah, but you can't get me to the bank. Hey, uh, Karen, we can hear you. You might want to mute you. You might want to mute you. You might want to mute, mute yourself.
Okay, how's the audio on this? How's the audio? Are you able to hear me? Yeah, there was a little feedback at first, but I think it went away. Yeah, I had to turn something off. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, you can hear you fine, Barry. Okay, now we're trying to connect to a TV. This thing? Yeah. Thank you, Barry. So we did that. Except then, oh, uh, there it is. Them, like, oh, these are my million dollar niggers. Right. And, and uh, but the, the yeah. employees got such yeah. that was just the way she thought. You know, Jews, Japs, niggers. Boom. Anything, anything had to be made. the down arrow. And uh, you can get to the close. But down. she was incredibly hmm. hard on the people in the office. She went to a general manager about every 18 months. Wow. And. Uh, <laughs> It says couldn't connect. Oh, is that good? Yeah. Uh, uh, in terms of we have, we have to turn on Bluetooth first. She just refused to buy it. She was incredibly cheap. Flowers with the required and dyed the whole place. Well, I don't know if you got a new dollar. I'll try this. I mean, I, 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 I think I remember that story. Yeah. Okay. All right. 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 That was impressive. Okay, I, perseverance. I may need to get some speakers here to make it. I can, uh, let's see here. The participant. Uh, Steve, could you say a few words? See if it's loud enough. Uh, hello, everyone. Okay, hello. we can hear you. Why? Yeah, what are you doing at home? Uh, I just, I just, I didn't really have, I didn't have uh, too much stuff going on today. So, so I didn't have time to, this saves me, you know, an hour and a half of not having to travel the back, back and forth. So. All right. Um, well, we have more people. Uh, we have a few people on Zoom. That's good. Uh, 
What I'd like to do is start, I'm sorry, I apologize for all the problems for being late. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, introducing ourselves and let's just talk about uh, how we got interested in baseball and how we got interested in saber. So uh, I will start by, uh, I'm Barry Mednick, uh, chapter president and responsible for this fiasco. And uh, I became interested in baseball when I was uh, about nine years old uh, for three reasons. One, my friends were interested. Uh, number two, I was very interested in math and uh, found out how it, fun it was to calculate batting averages and earned earn averages. And then my uncle bought a uh, Gillette razor and it came as a promotion with a vest pocket encyclopedia of baseball. I got one. Which I still have, it's, it's, a, it's a total wreck. It's in shreds and I keep it in a plastic bag and I'm sure after I die, my wife will just toss it out. But uh, that, that's what got me going. <clears throat> As far as Sabre, uh, my brother-in-law told me about it at my first wedding and uh, got me interested in that time. And I started up in the Bay Area about, I went to my first meeting in 83. So um, Jeff, why don't you come over here? Okay. And sit down. Where's the camera? Is it so, okay. It's, it's right oh, I see. I, yeah, I see it. Okay, hi, yeah, hi, I'm Jeff. Hubbard, uh, and uh, gee, I got involved in baseball because my father was uh, was a very good player. He played for the U.S. Navy and played semi-pro ball, and um, and uh, I remember uh, him saying the F word for the first time when the Dodgers lost the playoff in 1962 to the Giants. <laughs> uh, and uh, and then I played little league ball. I uh, I was great in little league. I pitched a no hitter. Um, when I got the Pony League, that all started to fall apart the first time I saw a curveball. Um, and then, um, so I didn't play much after that, um, softball and such, but uh, my playing days were short, but glorious. Uh, Sabre, I, I was in a computer baseball league in the 80s, and uh, all the smart guys would read Bill James' handbook. And, uh, and so... Uh, we would uh, debate in those days, I suppose it still goes on, uh, you know, analytics versus uh, the eye test. Uh, and so um, I got involved in analytics then, but didn't join Sabre until I retired about uh, 10 years ago now. So uh, that's it. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Andy McHugh. Um, I, I guess my reasons are pretty much the same as Barry's. I was nine years old uh, when the Dodgers moved to Los Angeles. And at that point, just starting Little League, and my friends are collecting baseball cards, which I found I had to join in. So um, from that uh, moment on, I was uh, uh, captured by baseball, started playing the, the table. Well, I made up my own tabletop game which was ridiculously unfair to everybody except the Dodgers. Uh, uh, <laughs> they won an awful lot, it was really strange. Uh, but anyway, then, uh, then I got uh, APBA and began to play that regularly. And uh, like Barry got interested in the statistical end of things and realized I wasn't gonna be uh, Maury Wills, but I, I, might, I might be Alan Roth. Um, and so that kind of drew me in. Um, I joined Sabre in 1982. I was actually living overseas, but I got the uh, I got the sporting news like six weeks late uh, in the <laughs> mail, and there was a guy named Stan Isle who was a correspondent there, and he used to mention this bunch fairly regularly, and I thought that was interesting. So I joined it in '82, even though I couldn't participate. And then uh, when we moved home to LA in '84, I started attending. Uh, the meetings, um, which were uh, just really interesting to me, the people and what they knew and what they could talk about and all of that kind of thing. So I just got very involved in that. I, uh, I, would, I was started out really doing research 
on baseball fiction because I was kind of a, a collector of, of that stuff, having read tons of it when I was a boy. And so I wrote a book about that. And then I got interested in more in the business side of baseball and been researching that pretty much ever since uh, a couple of books, one coming out next spring and uh, getting involved in Sabre Affairs. So it's been, my God, it's been almost 40 years of, of Sabre uh, and uh, still find it extremely enjoyable. So past president. I'm a past president of Sabre, 10, 12 years on the board, I guess, and two years as president. So anyway. <laughs> Hi, I'm David Hahn, uh, also the IT guy. Uh, <laughs> I'm a big Angels fan. Uh, usually we're meeting in Dodger territory, so it's nice to be in Angels territory this, this time. Um, I started in baseball, uh, baseball when I was about five or six, and I can remember my first pack of, of baseball cards from 1971 came from the Ice Cream Man in the black boxes. Um, so I've been collecting since 71. Uh, I read a lot. I, I started uh, reading a lot of the Sabre books and authors that are affiliated with Sabre uh, in, the, in the 80s. And then uh, about four or five years ago, my wife got me a membership for Sabre for Christmas and I've been a member since. Thanks. Yeah, watch your step over there. Yeah. yeah. I love this. Okay. Hello, my name is Greg. And uh, I got interested in baseball through my father. He was a butcher and in a little corner market and he always had a radio on and there was always something on sports. And it was a lot of baseball. And that time uh, I was born in 50. So around the age of five or six, it was usually the Pacific Coast League Angels, Los Angeles Angels that were on the radio that he was listening to. With Bob Kelly, I think, was the broadcaster. And uh, so in 1958, of course, the Dodgers came to Los Angeles and I was eight years old. And that was just fantastic. I followed them through the year. And then when they won the World Series in 59, they had me for life. So I've been a Dodger fan and uh, have enjoyed baseball. Uh, I did play, I didn't play Little League. I did play Pony League, but I was never that great. Uh, but I got into baseball games and I'm a Stratomatic baseball game. I have over 700 Stratomatic teams. I've been collecting since I was 13. So uh, I love the game uh, basically because you can play solitaire, you can play other people. But, uh, and then I got involved in Sabre because of Barry, we play cribbage together. And he invited me to one of the Sabre meetings because he found out I love baseball. And uh, I've enjoyed the meetings. I haven't done any research on my own, but I enjoy reading about what everybody else is writing and researching. And I've learned so much and read so much. It's really great. So uh, that's all. I'm Tim Doherty. Um, I guess I got really involved in uh, in baseball, obsessed in baseball. I guess in the '59 World Series, um, when everything with Larry Sherry and Chuck Asijian and Charlie Neal, and finding out that Larry Sherry went to Fairfax High School and Chuck Asijian went to High Fairfax High School, they were local guys, and so um, I pretty much fell in love with the team then and was just obsessed with it for. Uh, for most of the rest of my life. Um, it was the Dodgers and I have a bad habit of overdoing anything I do. So that meant baseball cards, that meant autographs, that meant going to every game I could beg, borrow and steal to go to. And I remember when I was 15, my big, one of my big dreams was 
to go to as many Dodger games as I could, as I wanted to. And that came true, um, such as it was. Uh, but uh, yeah, and I found baseball was the thing I could do best. I don't mean just play it. I played up as far as high school, but uh, as far as knowing things and understanding um, how things work and also being very interested in how things work um, on all levels. Um, so I guess the way I got into Sabre, I think, was I think Bob Hoey called me um, at home. I don't know how he got my number, um, but it was in the in the 80s. And he called me up and he was telling me about the a meeting they had. And uh, I was very interested in Negro Leagues. And Quincy Troop, who was a Negro League catcher, um, had been to one of their meetings. And since I collected autographs, Quincy Troop didn't answer mail. Most of the Negro League players answered mail, but he didn't. And I and I, when when I saw his name, Quincy Troop, I go, okay, maybe this is the, the group for me. Um, and he was saying what a great guy he was, and so on and so forth. And that got me interested. But I think it was Bob Hoey. I have no idea how he got my number, but he called, and that got me interested. And I met so many great people um, uh, through Cappy Gagnon, uh, Dick Beveridge, um, these guys, uh, and. Uh, it's really the only place where all these things, all these 70 years of my life have uh, all the baseball I've accumulated. There's no place else to talk about it <laughs> except here. Uh, and uh, it's so nice to not have to explain everything. So you can say a player's name and everybody, oh yeah, of course. Or they say, well, no, I, th I don't think he won the Cy Young that year. I think he won this year. <laughs> now, in my everyday life, they won't know what Cy Young is. Most of them don't really know anything about baseball except when the Dodgers win. But here, it's, uh, um, as Maya Angelou said, that all knowledge is, I think she said, all knowledge is currency depending on the market. And here, you can talk about the PCL and not have to explain it. Oh yeah, there was a league here before the Dodgers and have people go, first of all, who cares? And then what was that? So that's my story. My name is George Alfano. I got interested in baseball when uh, my granduncle took me to a game in 1962. It was a doubleheader Yankee at Yankee Stadium against the Washington Senators. And um, it was a doubleheader and Whitey Ford lost the first game but Jim Bouton pitched his first game and got a shutout, although he walked a whole bunch of batters. Um, I first went to a Sabre meeting in, um, in 1976, I think, in Washington, D.C. I was at a political event, but there was nothing going on, so and I knew about the meeting, so I went, and I was just amazed because, you know, these people just knew so much. I mean, I thought I knew a lot. <laughs> they were just wow. Uh, but a couple of years after that, I got involved as a sports writer, and that. That actually kind of depressed, not my interest, because I was always interested, but, you know, I, as part of the job, I had to cover other sports, and uh, it was mostly high school sports, and, uh, you know, it was a wider variety. Um, so uh, I saw the notice for this, and I joined Sabre again last year, and I saw this meeting and I decided to come. Great story. Oh,
Okay, well, let's let's uh, get the zoom the zoomites on here. Uh, so maybe we should do a study on uh, saber members and the obsessive compulsive disorder. <laughs> uh, uh, so, the answer all that. <laughs> Steve, uh, Steve Roney, why don't you go ahead? Hey, I don't. Uh... I don't really remember when I started following baseball. My earliest baseball memory is getting excited about finding a Roger Maris card on the back of a box of, of post cereal in 1962. Uh, well, I was, it was lots of lots of post cereals, but um, and so I obviously was aware of, of of him at that time, but I don't really remember. That's when I was. I would have been nine at, at the time that it would have come out, and. Uh, I know my first, my dad was not really a big baseball fan, so I didn't really uh, have that exposure to it. I'm not sure exactly where it all came from. Then in 19, uh, I think either 62 or 63, we went to a angel game with a group from church um, when they were playing in Dodger Stadium. I think they were playing the Red Sox. And, uh, and I know I, and I remember the Dodgers sweeping the Yankees in the 63 World Series, watching some of that on television. And then 1964, I was, I remember listening to the Angels, mostly the Angel games that year, especially, I think Dean Chance's Cy Young season really kind of cemented the Angels in baseball for me. And uh, as for Sabre in, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I started playing uh, at the baseball when I was probably 12 and um, eventually got into a league, a local league with uh, with a bunch of people, including Dallas Adams, who was, uh, who uh, was, I guess, co corresponded a lot with Bill James, even before Bill James had a big, huge following. And uh, so he was my introduction to the analysis section and to Bill James. And I think I eventually joined Sabre in like in 1984, I think, um, and didn't start coming to meetings until probably 87 or 88. But, uh, and, uh, been there ever since. My uh, my playing baseball. I never played baseball when I was growing up. But I just played. Uh, I played slow pitch softball starting in college, and 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 still played as recently as two weeks ago. So, <laughs> so I'm still playing as long as my knees can hold up, which my knees are what is give me the trouble now. But I think that's it's my story pretty much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, yourself, please? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, good. I am Karen Holleran and I am a Pirates fan. Pittsburgh Pirates fan. I grew up in Pittsburgh. So that was kind of the law at that point. <laughs> You, you were a Steeler fan, a Pirates fan, and a Penguins fan. I, um, none of my family were, were uh, baseball players or enjoy, even enjoyed it. They enjoyed football. So I kind of was the, the uh, odd man. Um, I um, became interested a long time, like 10, 20 years ago. I, um, I also had become interested in research because I'm a retired college professor. So I chose to look at baseball and research some of the baseball players. And I became interested in just presenting interest, you know, different types of uh, baseball uh, stuff. And I joined Sabre when I, uh, about 10 years ago. And I started looking at a dim different ideas of what's going on with, you know, with the different players. And um, that's it. I just, you know, it, it's weird when you, nobody in your family played any of those things, but I played the piano. So for me, you know, I, I just really enjoyed 
I, I was I was really lucky to see Roberto Clemente. So that was one of my my things for really enjoying the the team in Pittsburgh. And I can remember when I was really interested in it, and I played. Uh, I would go to all the team the the meeting or the the games, and they had a doll. Uh, they had a dollar game because they couldn't find people to go to the games. So they would charge a dollar. And I thought, you know, I'm not really doing that much. So I would just pay a dollar and go to the game. So that's about all. I'm, I'm glad that I, I like this, this group because you know so much. You really do. And it's really interesting to see, you know, and you put up with sometimes like me. <laughs> so it, it's an interesting place. Really, it really is. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, Ryan, why don't we go to you? Unmute, unmute. unmute, please. Yeah, yeah. I. I, I'm Ryan Schrader. I, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm living in Columbus, Indiana, but I've, I've been all over the country doing safer Zooms because, because I am one of those baseball OCD people that it's going to be in the, be in the safer study we're going to do about OCD fans. Um, I'm just pretty much, I just turned on the TV and saw the Cubs and WGN and basically just dedicated dedicated my life to it so it's i just love to talk baseball when it, when it were possible even if people don't understand me i don't care <laughs> so i'm glad to have few people who understand and put some more passion for something something that i have a passion for so thank you very much thank you uh jason let's go to you Hi, well, nice to be with you all this morning. Um, so I've been trying to think of my story. I guess uh, I grew up in LA in the 70s and in 1977, I was seven and the Dodgers were the team I got to go see now and then with my parents. And of course they went to the World Series those first two years and you can't get much more hooked as a kid than if your team gets to the World Series in your formative years. And at that point, everything since just became more and more and more baseball all I could get. When I was about nine, I got my first tabletop, which was um, the uh, status pro baseball game. I started playing that one and I played that pretty obsessively most of my youth. Uh, I got the new version when I was after the 82 season and I replayed the entire National League 82 season. I never met anyone else who ever actually sat and had the patience to do that over the years, but that was great. And um, and then um, <clears throat> when I was, uh, I worked for a while as a sports writer and editor. Uh, I got, at one point I was interviewing a, in my mid twenties, I was interviewing a guy for a story. Uh, he, had, he had called up the paper and wanted to chat baseball because he's got the impression I knew a lot about baseball from what I wrote. And he got me interested in Sabre. I joined for a while in the nineties and I went to a local meeting down. We went to a Lake Elsinore storm game and had a meeting down there, I remember. <clears throat> and I don't know why I stopped being a member. I can't even recall a decision, but at some point I just let it lapse. And I do remember um, having some baseball conversations with Andy McHugh and with George Alfano. We worked together at the Press Enterprise here in Riverside. Um, so it's nice to see both of those guys again. And um, Andy used to talk baseball all the, every time I ran into him. And that was great. And I don't know why I didn't get rejuvenated into Sabre until recently, but I have always been a, a big fan. And then I started listening to the Sabre casts on the podcast and I, and I was like, hey, wait a minute, I know that organization. Why am I not a member of it anymore? And so I, um, I rejoined and I've really been enjoying all the benefits of it and trying to maybe do a little bit of research here using some of the, the tools that are now available. Um, that's pretty exciting. So I want to try to, you know, write a couple of the box score stories and some things like that um, and, and invest a little of my time into that as things go forward. Um, so I, it's great. This is the first, I, I would have been there live today if I hadn't gotten my booster shot yesterday. I was pretty afraid that I was going to end up 
been lying on the couch all day today. So I felt it was better to stay at home. And I do have to go in and out a couple of times today, but I'm gonna to try to sit in for as much as I can. So thanks for having us. I'm glad you got the tech worked out. Yeah, okay. Uh, Don. Uh, good morning. Yeah, my name is Don Zeminda. I grew up in the Chicago area, uh, born in 1948. And I went to my first game with my dad and my brother in uh, August of 1954 at uh, Old Comiskey Park on the south side. And uh, I just got hooked by the whole experience. And subsequent to that, um, it really became a way of bonding with my father and my brother as well. Um, but baseball was a kind of common language among all of us. And um, particularly when I was when I was a young kid, uh, we used to go to night games sometimes on the south side, and it just seemed like such an adult thing to do. So uh, that's really how I got started and uh, just stayed with it ever since then. Um, my interest in Sabre um, um, really started with the sporting news. I remember seeing um, Sabre referred to in various articles in the 1970s. And um, Bob Davids in particular often had um, little articles that um, the sporting news would publish. You know, Stan Musial was, you know, moving up on the all time total base list or something like that. It was always interesting stuff. So I knew about the organization and um, I attended my first meeting. It was the Emil Rothi chapter in the Sabre in Chicago. And I was just stunned by the knowledge of these guys. And uh, that really got me going. I joined in 1979 and I've stayed with the organization ever since. It's fantastic. Uh, the Chicago group is great. I was involved with the Milwaukee group as well when I lived in the Chicago area. There was another great organization, another great Sabre chapter. And uh, as soon as I came out here in 2000, I joined up with the LA group and uh, so happy to be part of the organization and so happy to be with you guys today. Okay, thank you. Uh, is it Joel? Ryan? Yeah, Joel. Joel, sorry. Hi, yeah, this is great. Um, yeah, um, I was introduced to baseball in a uh, couple of ways. The first was watching an episode of Wonderama and uh, Joe Garagiola was the guest. And I've, I feel like I'd literally never heard of baseball and uh, something about that interview led me to our encyclopedia set and I like read the rules and got my little brother and it was like, if you've ever heard of the Shags, which was like a band which apparently has just never heard music before. And it was like trying to like figure out to recreate with the rules of baseball that I'd read in the encyclopedia it didn't quite work out. So then um, I also grew up in LA in the seventies and there was a um, talk show uh, hosted by a woman named Carol Hemingway. So I was a weird little kid and I listened to the show and she was often interrupted uh, by Dodger baseball. So that started um, and uh, me finally like, I would stay, listen to the games. And it was also the 1977, 1977, 1978 Dodgers, um, which hooked me. It really is the perfect gateway entry drug. I've noticed my neighbor's kids across the street who have rooted now for the Dodgers once they started going to the World Series. And I, I try to prepare them because 1979 taught me, it's like, oh, you actually don't win every year. And sometimes baseball is really quite soul crushing. Like it's really awful. Um, so, uh, there's that. And then um, I recently am a brand new Sabre me member. I joined probably about a month ago. Um, I had just, for the last 10 years, I uh, was very involved in my son's uh, Pony League, uh, coaching his teams and on the board. Uh, and so just have transitioned out of that because he's starting, uh, he's in high school now and uh, I no longer have anything relevant for him to hear from me. So um, I have redirecting sort of my, uh, my interest in, uh, and also I think partly, I, I don't know why, honestly, I didn't join earlier. I don't know why I wasn't exactly sure that it was a group. Um, I think what finally led me down was I've just fallen in love with the war statistic. And I think that finally, I mean, just like, it's like my favorite thing, like, so um, I think that finally led me down to this. And I like, again, uh, moving out of uh, sort of helping manage my son's career, 
such as it is, uh, led me to this. And I'm actually also going to contribute, hope to contribute some game report stories uh, and contribute in that way. And if I probably will be running out because I've got to get my son something in a little bit, but I'm really glad. I love hearing like, I really, really love hearing like, how did you fall in love with baseball stories? It's great. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Uh, Michael. <clears throat> Hello, can you guys hear me? You're fine. Great. Um, so I guess I got into baseball kind of like some others. I, you know, I grew up in a Red Sox family, so I was born and raised in Red Sox uh, fandom. And then I really didn't get into baseball until after my first year of Little League, um, got my first pack of baseball cards. And that's what really um, sparked my interest into the history of baseball. Um, since then, I've mostly primarily been focused on the California League. Um, the one that specifically started in 1941. Um, so I kind of put together a website, started collecting everything from California League history. Um, I've been working with the, the league historian, uh, Chris Lampy, to put together kind of a comprehensive history book on the league. Um, I have a really extensive collection from the California League. So uh, I kind of stumbled upon Sabre um, during some of my research and I thought it was <clears throat> a perfect group to join. Um, so this is actually my first meeting. So thank you guys for having me. Um, I also play in the Southern California Vintage Baseball League. Um, I have a game a little bit later, so I'm going to be heading out um, in the next 15 minutes here. But I'm glad I got a chance to um, to see everybody and meet everyone. And I look forward to getting more involved. Yeah, we'd like to hear some of your research on the uh, California League at a future meeting. So. Oh, I've, yeah, I have plenty. So, um, you know, I put together quite a few article or I guess research projects on various teams and seasons. So um, I know you, probably most of you guys, is, once you start researching something specific, you go down a rabbit hole. And then, so I have a lot of unfinished projects because I keep finding other things to, to research. So, but yeah, I'd love to share it if you guys um, are interested in it. Yeah, as they say, the more you know, the more you don't know. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Perry. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Everybody can you hear me? Sure. Okay. So uh, you may notice I'm in my car. I'm driving from Chicago to my winter home in Port St. Lucie, Florida. And I'm currently somewhere on the Georgia Tennessee line. So um, if my cat pops into the camera, uh, that's why she's running loose in my car. So I, I, I stopped to hear all of these really amazing and wonderful sort of baseball origin stories that are just always so much fun and so interesting to hear. Mine is sort of unusual. I, I came to baseball kind of through the back door, uh, not as a game or a spectacle to go watch, but as a subject that you study in school um, because I had been a Jeopardy champion when I was 19 years old uh. and people were constantly challenging me to trivia as a result, um, thinking that if they could beat me, a Jeopardy champion, that, you know, that would mean that they were great at trivia. So I, I was pretty good in most categories, but baseball, I had no clue. And I finally decided to educate myself when I went to a bookstore and I picked out a few books. And within 24 hours, I was completely irrevocably hooked on baseball. And mostly old time baseball, like the 1905 New York Giants of Christy Mathewson, John McGraw, Rue Marquardt, characters like that. And, and then I had to make a momentous decision as a New Yorker. I, I asked my boyfriend at the time to take me to see the Yankees and the Mets because I had to decide, was I a Yankees or a Mets? So um, this was 1979 and the Yankees were just coming off of that, you know, streak where they were always in the World Series. They had Reggie Jackson, he did three home runs in one series, Greg Nettles, they, you know, great teams. And the Mets had um, Doug Flynn and Craig Swan and Pat Zachary. And collectively they were, they were endearingly inept. 
<laughs> Although individually they were very talented and I just kind of fell in love with the Mets uh, for that reason, because they were the underdogs at that time. And um, then my mother saw me reading a book about umpires sort of unbelievably. And in 1981, I started umpiring Little League Baseball out in California, where she was living at the time. And 41 years later, I'm still umpiring. And although I, I was not a professional umpire in that I was not in the minor leagues, but I, I have umpired pro ball. I've been fortunate enough to umpire major league spring training almost every year for the last 40 years. And I've been all over the world umpiring international baseball. And I do spring training with the Mets and a lot of the teams down in Florida and the Cape Cod League and just had a blast for the last 40 years. And if anybody doesn't think umpiring is fun, I'm here to disabuse you of that notion. Because um, I know, a lot, well, a lot of people have the mistaken impression that, you know, umpires stand around on a dime and, you know, screw up on pitches and um, blow call, calls out there. But uh, most of us, from major leagues all the way down to the little league, and I work a lot of the leagues that people here play in, adult leagues, vintage leagues, um, think leagues like that, amateur leagues. Um, but, you know, as long as you still have fun and, and are physically able to, you know, walk or a amble around, um, baseball is just the greatest way to have fun and maintain relationships. And, and for me personally, to learn how to navigate my relationships in my daily life because of things that I learn on the field as an umpire, which are so valuable to um, getting, helping me interact in ways that end successfully uh, instead of, you know, with bad hurt feelings and, you know, nothing happening. So um, I've been very fortunate and just love going to these Sabre meetings. And thank you very much for asking me to join you here been a lot of fun so well, Perry did any player ever call you a dirty word <laughs> oh, I have a I have a list yeah <laughs> but I, I'm not naming any names right now but I do want to mention that uh, right now I also am working on a Sabre bio project and a Sabre games project article about my great uncle Jim McLaughlin who was one of those oddball players that played one game in the major leagues for the St. Oh. Louis Browns in 1932. Oh. So I'm working on a, a Sabre bio project about him and a Sabre game project as well. So the, I would, I'm would i gonna um, time it uh, to coincide with the game that he worked 90 years ago next April. So it's gonna be kind of interesting. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, thank Rick. you. Yeah, Rick, you wanna? Introduce yourself, please. Yeah, good morning. Uh, sorry, my camera is on the fritz. Um, my interest in baseball really exploded in 1958 when I started playing Little League and the Dodgers moved to LA. One of my early childhood memories, uh, fond memories, was when I got to leave school one day uh, in 1960 uh, so my dad and I could go see the Dodgers at the Coliseum. Um, my mom was less pleased that I uh, uh, got out of school that day, but uh, I did have a lot of fun. Um, about three years later, my dad scored a couple of tickets to game five of the 63 series. And that was the one and only time in, during game four where I really struggled. I had uh, quite a dilemma. I wanted the Dodgers to beat the Yankees, but on the other hand, I wanted to go to game five. Well, as you all know, Sandy Kovacs uh, uh, won uh, game four. I did not go to the World Series that year. Fortunately, went uh, a number of years later. But uh, that was the one and only time I struggled with my loyalty to the Dodgers. I joined Sabre in 1983 after reading uh, a little anthology paperback called The National Pastime, edited by John Thorne. Some of you probably remember that that paperback and uh, went to a number of con uh, national conventions. I haven't been in several years, but hope to go to Baltimore uh, next August, assuming that uh, 
goes on as planned. So I look forward to seeing folks uh, there. Thanks, Barry. All right, thank you. I, uh, did I miss anybody online? I think we're okay. Uh, let me get uh, Andy's device going here. Uh, we have some bad news. Uh, unfortunately, Noel Hind is uh, in the hospital with minor surgery. Uh, minor surgery being defined as surgery on somebody else. But uh, Noel, Noel will be okay, but he couldn't be here today. And uh, so uh, Andy, is, Andy McHugh is going to talk about now the... Uh, Talk about Ford Frick. Now let me get this open for you. And uh, where are we here? Share your screen. Okay. Oh. Good morning, and Barry, thank you for uh, setting this all up. Um, I guess I, I started this project a couple of years ago talking with a Dave Bone, who may, um, many of you may know. He's working on a biography of Ford Frick, and uh, he was defending Frick. And at that point, I said, I didn't say it, but I thought it, Dave, come on, you've been captured by your subject. Uh, everybody knows the guy uh, really didn't do anything and uh, went away from it. And then as I was researching my, my current book, it began to strike me that Dave was actually right. And there was a lot to be said, not so much about Ford Frick, but about the, the uh, environment in which, he, uh, in, in which he worked. These are uh, some of the uh, comments uh, we've, that kind of produced the, the image that Frick uh, has today. This is, uh, Columnist Red Smith, baseball people did not like Ford, or sorry, newspaper people did not particularly like uh, uh, Ford Frick. Um, and he was the, they were the ones who uh, or needled him for saying it was always a league matter. Um, and uh, it consistently, they, were, they didn't like commissioners in general. Um, this I thought of some great, uh, this is a, a, the owner of the White Sox in the, in the 60s, Arthur Allen who, as you can tell, was also not a fan. Uh, but I think his comments on Joe Cronin and Warren Giles are uh, kind of interesting as well. And then there's uh, uh, Gabe Paul, who was, of course, a longtime executive and, and owner. And he was not exactly a, a uh, Frick fan as well. Guys, I'm having trouble reading that. I should have made the type bigger. Let me make a note about that. But anyway, let's go back and, and put the kind of... Uh, context of, of what the commissioners did. Um, early on, uh, baseball, the, the various leagues were just run by committees of their owners uh, who did whatever they wanted to. Um, most of the leagues in the 19th century, except for the National League, eventually fail. Um, in 1901, the American League comes along and it proves to be more competition than the National League really wants. Uh, they had just finished a kind of knockdown, drag out battle with the American Association um, in the 90s and then taking a bunch of American Association teams and then getting rid of them. And uh, so the American League comes in and they decide it's easier to uh, join them than to beat them. And to deal with the various problems, they create uh, what is called the National Commission. Uh, the National Commission was made up of the president of the American League who throughout this period is Ban Johnson. The period, by the way, is 1903 to 1920. Uh, Ban Johnson is the president of the American League the whole time. The National League president at this point is Harry Pulliam. The National League will go back and forth between eight to seven different presidents uh, in that period. Um, and the guy with the mustache in the middle is Gary Herman, uh, who was the owner of the Reds. Uh, he was obviously a National League owner, but he had a longtime friendship with Ban Johnson, who'd been a, a newspaper reporter and editor of sports sections in Cincinnati papers, and they know each other very well from that 
So it was felt that Herman could uh, balance his National League loyalties with um, his relationship with Johnson and things would be fair. John Brush was in the picture. He was the secretary of the commission, but he, he didn't have a vote. He was also the owner of the, of the Giants during this period. What did the National Commission do? Um, basically, they were there to resolve any issues that came up between the two leagues. Uh, at the beginning, they spent a fair amount of time on the World Series, which was a new idea, first played in 1903. Uh, then they would have to deal with the fact that in 1904, John McGraw refuses uh, for the Giants to play. He felt they'd already really, they played 154 games and won, proving they were the best, and he wasn't really very respectful of the American League. So the commission has to step in, 1904 isn't played, but then they make sure that 1905 is played and the World Series has continued except for 1994 since then. But the, the most, the thing that the National Commission was involved in mostly was settling disputes over players between, first of all, between National League and American League teams as to because the American League had pirated a whole bunch of players from the National League. Um, so they had to settle all those. And then there was a kind of run of common disputes between uh, teams from the different leagues trying to get a certain minor league player and the relationships with minor leagues. There were problems over uh, the schedules. Uh, everybody wanted to be home on July 4th. Everybody wanted to be home on Memorial Day. And even though there are 16 teams at this point, there were only 10 cities. So there's a lot of overlap when, they're, when you're looking at schedules. And then when the Federal League comes along in the mid-teens, again, there's a lot of uh, adjudication over um, who owns whom, who gets what Federal League player. There were a couple of Federal League owners who came into majors and uh, either they brought players with them or they didn't bring players with them. And there were a lot of disputes like that that had to be settled. Um, but uh, the, the thing that I would emphasize here about the National Convention is that it's really a reactive body. It's designed to deal with problems within baseball, not to deal with anything in the outside world. And the issues they deal with are brought to them. They are not proactive. They are not doing anything for baseball as a whole. They are reacting to a decision that has to be made because, uh, because the Pirates think they own a player and the Yankees think they own the same guy and that has to be distributed. So it's from the, from the beginning here, you're looking at something that is, that is very reactive. But the, the National Commission, uh, I mean, the, the, the common uh, narrative is that the National Commission fell apart uh, because of the Black Sox scandal and they had to bring in Landis. That's really not so. Uh, the National Commission had begun to fall apart, in fact, Herman, uh, kind of disgusted with the whole thing, had resigned and I think it's February of 2020 before the real news of the Black Sox scandal had broken. Um, uh, ban Johnson was kind of, Ban Johnson had an extremely strong grip on the American League in the early years. That was, that was loosening just because, you know, people had problems and they didn't like Johnson's uh, response to them. So even his stalwart supporters like Charles Comiskey were, were moving away from them. Um, John Heidler uh, was particularly concerned about gambling even before the Black Sox scandal broke. In 1919, he had uh, tried to do a, uh, an investigation of Hal Chase. He found what he thought was just an enormous amount of smoke and was really, really frustrated that he couldn't find any fire. Uh, so he felt that he couldn't suspend Chase even though he was sure something was going on. And his solution to that was to say that baseball really needed a single person who was really in charge. Then the Black Sox uh, scandal breaks, Herman is not in place, and they decide that they're going ahead and hire um, a commissioner. So they hire Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who of course looks like a baseball commissioner. Um, and you know, he's got that jut jawed, uh, you know, American look, and he's uh, got a reputation for fighting for the little guy through a series of judicial decisions that he made against Standard Oil and some other people, virtually all of which are overturned by higher courts. But he's uh, he's taken this very populist position and, and 
working for the little guy and he did, he loved to pose. Um, so he, uh, he becomes the commissioner. Um, but uh, again, uh, I would emphasize what he's doing. His job, his premier job is to uh, clean up the game. And of course he deals in his own way with the Black Sox people and with other gambling scandals to the point where it's pretty much safe to say that except for a couple of incidents, uh, Bill Cox during World War II, the owner of the Phillies who was banned for gambling, and of course, Pete Rose, uh, the game has been free of those kind of accusations since then. The only activist thing that uh, Landis did was very much in terms of his, his, his hatred of the farm system and uh, the work he did to uh, try unsuccessfully to uh, break up uh, chain baseball too. He did free uh, some players, Pete Reeser, Tommy Heinrich, uh, were freed from their uh, uh, relationships with their current major league teams and went on to, to get very nice bonuses and, and sign with others. Um, but basically, again, his job was to take problems such as they were that were brought to him by the major leagues and to react to them. The only point where he was really being active was in regards to chain baseball uh, and with the minors. So that's kind of the, the background uh, of the commissioner's office up to, up to Frick's predecessor. Now let's take a look at Frick. Um, there he is born in Wawaka, Indiana. And that is Wawaka, Indiana today, which uh, I suppose is uh, certainly that trailer is more modern than it looked before Frick's day, but uh, it is a very small farming town in, in Southern Indiana. Um, Frick uh, works hard, he goes to high school there, eventually goes to DePaul University, um, gets himself a bit of an education. Uh, after, after DePaul, I'm not quite sure why, but he moves out to Colorado, which at that point seemed to be a, uh, this is in the late teens, right at the end of World War I and into the 20s. Um, he teaches high school English, he teaches college English. He almost starts kind of a little PR firm, there's a bit of that eventually hooks on with the, the newspapers in Denver and then gets his big break. The Arkansas River overflows its boundary and floods Pueblo, Colorado. Um, all the big Denver papers are determined to get the story. Their uh, reporters hire airplanes to fly quickly down to Pueblo. Um, but the thing about uh, airports in 1921 is they are dirt. That turns into mud, and the planes that landed bringing these reporters couldn't take off again, so they couldn't send in their stories. Uh, Frick has the wit to hire a plane, but tell it not to land, and it circles very low while he takes notes of what he can see, uh, and also to take pictures. He goes back to Denver, gets this huge 24-hour beat on the, the other papers, um, and uh, begins to make his name. This, for your information, that is what the Arkansas River in downtown Pueblo looks like today, uh, just a bit tamed. Uh, anyway, he comes to the attention of the Hearst people, of a guy named Arthur Brisbane, who is the editor of the New York American. And Frick goes to New York to work for the American. Um, he does a little bit of this. He begins to concentrate on sports. He becomes an early broadcaster for uh, WOR which is still one of the huge stations in New York City. Um, and he does a little bit of this, a little bit of that, mostly in sports. He travels with the teams. He gets to know everybody. He becomes particularly close with Babe Ruth, who he golfs with and eventually um, writes for. Uh, this is the work of Ford Frick, despite the uh, author title there. This book, by the way, I, the, the picture I found on an auction website, they wanted $5,000 for this book. So if you own it, uh, it's a good deal. I think a lot of it has to do with the quality of the dust jacket, which is, which is pretty amazing. Um, anyway, uh, so he's working in the newspaper business. In 1934, he gets an offer to be the public relations director for the National League. Now, this is kind of with an understanding that John Heidler, who is still the president, remember, we met him back in 1990, he is still the president, he's going to retire pretty soon, and certainly by the end of 1934, Frick has been confirmed as the National League president. 
Uh, he will stay that way until the until the early 50s. Um, here you can see him with Landis and with um, uh, oh God, what is his name? I'm doing this more and more. Uh, anyway, the, the American League president at the time, and Will I'm sorry, Harridge, Will Harridge, right? Uh, he Harridge will remain the AL president until 59, I think it is. Um, so what does he do? But Rick's big thing uh, as the National League president was uh, uh, pushing for the Hall of Fame, which he did successfully. Interesting, Landis was completely uninterested in the idea. Uh, claimed he knew nothing about it. Even when the, the process of creating was several years old, Landis would say, I don't know anything about that. Um, but uh, pursued and eventually, you know, he worked with Cooperstown, he worked with the, the Singer sewing machine family who put up a lot of money and eventually got it off the ground. Uh, this was, they started electing people in 36, but they didn't have a building and an induction ceremony until 39. And those are the people, although most of the people, some, I guess McGraw was dead and I think somebody else uh, had passed on, but this was the, the original uh, group. Um, so anyway, then in late 1944, the judge dies, Happy Chandler, who uh, knew how to imitate uh, the people, uh, took his place. And But there's an interesting headline on the sporting news story of Chandler's election. They, they say Chandler wants to lead. He doesn't just want to react to things that are brought to his table. He actually wants to lead. And But Happy says something about uh, that is pretty much in line with what Frick would say later and what commissioners before him had said. Nevertheless, happy, uh, happy. The, the baseball owners were unhappy more with the possibilities of what Landis could have done than what he did. He'd obviously irritated many of them were with small decisions over the years, uh, but in general, they had gotten from him uh, what they wanted. Still, they wanted to make sure that. Uh, uh, Chandler didn't have quite the freedom that Landis had. So they put some things in. They, here's Basically, they say that anything we do, you can't say is detrimental to baseball. You can't exercise your powers over things detrimental to baseball if we decide to. Um, you can't, uh, you can, we can sue you, which we couldn't sue Landis but we can now sue you over something, whatever it might be. Um, and they made it harder for a commissioner who had made people unhappy uh, to get reelected. Um, before that, uh, if you irritated four people, you could not be reelected. Now all you needed to do was irritate three people in one league. Uh -huh. uh, you know, one league could be completely happy with you, but the three owners uh -huh. in the other league, uh, were unhappy with you, you could go. Now Chandler does get the owners to agree that they they won't criticize him in public, uh, which I guess was a soft to him. Anyway, uh, Chandler tries to be a more activist uh, commissioner. He in investigates Fred Sy for tax evasion. Uh, Sy eventually does do several years in federal prison for tax evasion. Um, he investigates uh, Del Webb for connections to the mob. Um, Del had built uh, one of the first casinos in Las Vegas uh, for Bugsy Siegel. Uh, he would continue to build casinos for the mob for the rest of his life um, and evidently had quite a number of ties there, but it, this came to nothing. But now he, he has some people who really, really don't like him among the owners group. And then in the in the normal routine kind of decisions that he was supposed to make, he began to alienate other people. Uh, this is Bill DeWitt of the Browns who were in serious financial trouble. He'd had to borrow $300,000 from the American League to keep operating and Will Herridge hated uh, Chandler. And so uh, DeWitt was steered away from doing anything that would support him. Um, this is Lou Perini who felt that uh, 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 Chandler was overly uh, solicitous of what the Red Sox wanted uh, in a time when, of course, the Perini, the Braves had won the 
championship in 48 started to fade pretty quickly afterwards and uh, we're getting into financial trouble that would eventually lead them, of course, to, to move after the 53 season. And um, Charles Comiskey Jr. got crosswise with him over a, a schoolboy phenom from Chicago. Um, Chandler uh, was rigorously enforcing the rule that you couldn't sign a player until his high school class had graduated. Uh, the White Sox had signed this kid. Um, Chandler took him away. Uh, Comiskey got very angry with that. I forget the kid's name. He, he never really made it. So anyway, Chandler realizes that uh, Ch Chandler very much wants to be uh, confirmed with the, with the second term. And even though his term won't run out until 53, he begins lobbying in 1951 to get a second term. The owners say, well, hey, you know, don't worry. We've got till 53. Let's be calm. Chandler doesn't like this. He gets worried. And eventually, under some pressure in 1952, he resigns and the owners uh, bring in Ford Frick. Okay, now Frick, uh, this is interesting. This is, these are exactly what he was, what his duties were defined as, okay? There's this investigate anything not in the interests of baseball, the best interests of baseball. Exactly what that means is undefined. Uh, and once he investigates, he can do anything about it. Uh, he can, if the leagues can't come to an agreement, he can make a decision. Um, and it, it, like the traditional ones that uh, the commissioners have always had, he uh, can decide issues regarding a player and formulate the rules for his office. Um, what, what he did get involved in were things that had not really bothered commissioners before that, uh, at least on, on a large scale. Uh, after uh, after really uh, Landis had dealt with the, the gambling related issues. But now all of a sudden you've got all of the demographic changes in the country, which are uh, creating expansion early in Frick's team term. You have Braves going from Boston to Milwaukee, the uh, Browns going from St. Louis to Baltimore, and then the A's going from Philadelphia to Kansas City, all of them as a result of the, the demographic changes in the country. So, and then there's consequent pressure from, uh, for expansion. Uh, the thing Frick is most successful at really is dealing with Congress. So going and testifying and calming them down. And it was an interesting uh, balancing act. You had, you had the West and the South saying, we want Major League Baseball. Let's expand, let's get teams moved out here. And you have the old, uh, East Coast and Upper Midwest cities saying, wait, you can't take away our teams. And you've got congressmen from all of these places um, leaning down on baseball. Um, so he manages to, to play that out. And significantly, all of, all of these crucial decisions are being made by individual owners, you know, starting with Lou Perini moving the Braves uh, to Milwaukee and winding up with Stoneham and O'Malley moving the Giants and the Dodgers uh, to California. Um, he's also got to deal with television contracts, integration, all of these kind of issues that you, that you see on the, on the screen here. And many of them call for real thought and decision. And this is what the, the newspaper reporters are looking for. They're looking for some, some leadership. They're looking for... Um, somebody to, to you know, really kind of lay out a plan of where baseball is going to go, what cities they're going to go to, how franchise movement is going to be controlled, how expansion is going to take place. And the fact of the matter is the league owners aren't willing to give that up. This is a power that they have as a group or as, as an individual. I can move my franchise where I want to go. As a group, we can approve or not approve that. As a group, we can decide how we're going to expand to where and who the, who the new members of our group are going to be. These are all powers we don't want to give up. And yet the, the newspaper people, because that's what we were talking about at the time, not television, uh, the newspaper people are, are looking for answers and they're looking for leadership. And the system is not designed to provide that. The system is designed 
to keep those kind of things in the hands of the owners. <coughs> <coughs> now, just Barry, can you hand me that that drink down there, please? I'm getting kind of dry for too much talking. Um, the fact of the matter is that a lot of the newspaper people are. Thank you. Um, are getting a bit panicky. This is the 1950s and early 60s are a time when a lot of big city newspapers are closing. The afternoon papers are under a lot of strain from television coming along and providing local news uh, in the evenings <clears throat> and they're going. So newspapers are closing, which means sports writing jobs are being lost. Now, all of a sudden, starting with Boston, you have uh, an entire team leaving half half of the baseball jobs in that city and subsequently in Philadelphia and in and St. Louis are being lost. And then in New York, where a paper traditionally had at least four people covering baseball, one for each team and one guy as a floater to cover vacations and, and the odd story. So that's at least a dozen jobs. Uh, well, sorry, you know, four guys at each paper so a shrinking number of papers and then two thirds of those jobs disappear when the Giants and the Dodgers leave. So those guys are under pressure and, and, and they recognize that. And I think that's part of, of what they're doing with uh, in criticizing uh, Frick. But their, their real problem is they don't understand where the real power lies or they don't want to understand where the real power lies uh, in that the owners want to keep uh, control of this, that there is no the commissioner of baseball is not the CEO of baseball. He, he's there, he's partially as a figurehead, partially to deal reactively with certain, uh, certain kind of issues, but not to make broad decisions uh, about the game, which is what the newspaper people want. Now this, we're gonna go back to the Red Smith quote, because I think the, the italic part is what I showed you earlier. Uh, and then is uh, the rest of it. Uh, and that was really his philosophy. He recognized what the situation was. They were in charge. They made the rules. And he was there just to, to carry them out. And that did not involve being a, a CEO for baseball, which is what people were looking for. So that's why I say he, it was a lead matter. And uh, his critics, I think, misunderstood the, the basic dynamic of power within the game at that point. So uh, I thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Tim. Yeah, that, that, that's a, a rather a sticky issue. Uh, but, 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 if, but if, you know, if so many said no, you can't. Well, it's not clear that they said no, I think, Tim. That's the problem. There, there was a 15 to 1 vote, but exactly what they voted on, at least to my mind, is unclear. They produced a report. I think McPhail wrote this report, Larry McPhail. Um, I'm sorry, what was, what was the question? Could you repeat that, please? Oh, the, 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 the question was um, that there was a, a, a owner's 15 to 1 vote against integration um, in the 1946 period. Thank you. What, what was Chandler's reaction to that? Um, I don't know what Chandler's exact reaction was. As I was saying, this this vote was on a report done by McPhail, which covered a lot of things, one of which was to raise some questions about whether this was a, a good idea. Uh, just be, I mean, McPhail in other places made it very clear that he was worried that if too many black people began showing up at Yankee Stadium, his white customers would stay away. So it was definitely a live issue of, among baseball ownership, exactly. I, I've seen several articles on that 15 to one vote and none of them really, to my mind, made it clear what they were voting, whether they were voting on the whole report or um, 
whether that's the way they understood it. Um, you might look at Lee Lowenfish's biography of Ricky, uh, which deals with that uh, uh, to a great extent, uh, trying to sort it out. But it's 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 a, a murky question. There was a 15-1 vote. What exactly it was about, I think, is is unclear. So as far as you know, the chamber has never faced with the decision to make on that decision. Um, no, he he. Happy was a, a real good politician, and he kind of straddled the whole integration issue over the years in various ways. And at the time of Robinson coming in, he said all of the right things in public. Uh, then he would go back to Kentucky and run for governor on a, on a pretty racist platform. And then he would come back to the national market and, and be all in, in favor of integration and all of that. And in his autobiography, he would paint himself as being strongly in favor of, of integration, but he, he went back and forth. Yes. Um, was Landis an active federal judge during the time he was commissioner of baseball? Uh, the, the question was whether Landis was an active federal judge um, while he was commissioner of baseball. And the answer is yes, briefly. When he started out, he uh, argued to retain his position, and I think it was for like six months uh, before he stepped down from the from the bench and, and became a full time commissioner. Yeah, just one more. Um, Rick is, is notorious for his asterisk. Yeah. And uh, what? And we all know that with that. Yeah. That meant. Can you talk about that a little bit? Okay, the, the question is about the infamous asterisk on Maris's home run uh, record. First of all, Frick never suggested the asterisk. He was, he was asked about it, and of course, it was assumed, and there's, there's some evidence of it, that he was, he was Babe Ruth's ghost. He knew the man. He was very uh, protective of the man. Um, and he did suggest that maybe it would be a good idea to acknowledge Maris's uh, record, but in a separate category, so to speak, like, you know, parentheses, 162 games, as opposed to parentheses, 154 games. Dick Young of the Daily News came up with the idea that it should be an asterisk that it would, but, but Frick, Frick never used that word or never said that. And it, it just kind of went away and everybody accepted that, the record was the record. Maris had hit that many home runs in a season. Um, and so it was, I mean, he, Frick recognized it when he, uh, his autobiography is called Games, Asterisks, and People. Uh, but he never, he never suggested the asterisk himself. Okay. Anybody else? <coughs> Any other questions? How about online? Andy, can I, <clears throat> can I follow up on that? I, uh, I actually watched 61 last night by coincidence. And ah. I, and so I have fresh in my mind how harshly that movie portrayed him and as, as being such a Ruth guy. And, uh, and I wonder, since you titled this, his critics and his employers, was, was his assessment of that as a separate record popular among the owners? I mean, or did he sort of stand out and take a, a public stance that, maybe wasn't a, agreed upon privately? I don't know. Um, I don't think the owners cared. Um, you know, they like Maris hitting home runs because people came out to see him. Um, I, I, I think it's one of those typical baseball tempest in a teapot. Um, you know, somebody gets concerned about an issue and some of the, some of the sports writers get concerned about an issue and they bring it up and they, and they beat the drum and I mean, we know from sports talk radio today how little tiny things can get blown incredibly out of proportion. Um, and I think this is, this is an, an example in a, in a different era where you, you didn't have quite the, the magnification of radio and television, but you did have these issues that, that either intrigue the sports writer or in case of some of the very, uh, very traditional ones uh, offend them that I mean, there was sympathy for for Frick's position. Everybody loved the babe, right? You had to love the babe, um, and and Maris was not a particularly lovable figure, at least to the public. 
Um, so, I mean, I, again, it, it was there, it was an issue. I don't think it was very important, which is why now people, it, you talk about the record, the only thing that really gets people interested is whether there was an asterisk or not, because they know what the record was, Maris hit them. <laughs> Seven inning no hitters. Seven inning no hitters. Yeah. <laughs> you, I mean, you can start a controversy over just amazingly small stuff, uh, but that that's uh, that's the nature of the beast, I think. Yeah, it's just that that's the thing that most of us know him for, even to yeah. today. So, I mean, it may have been not big in the history of the game, but it was a big enough that it overshadowed everything else he did, as you were pointing out. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that that that's the issue that people tend to remember, um, and and the, well, and the, and the second thing would be how how incompetent he was and and how he dodged all of these issues. Uh, but yeah, people remember it. I don't, you know, there's not much you can do about that except to say, yeah. As the as, uh, the National League president was Frick. Yes, today you might call an activist, you know, did he make decisions, you know, more or less frequently than other league presidents? Because the one thing I do remember is uh, there was, you know, during Jackie Robinson's first year, there was some. The St. Louis thing? Yeah. Yeah. All right. The, the, the question is whether Frick was a more of an activist league president than the others at the time. Um, and, I, and well, he was certainly more activist than Will Herridge, who was who did nothing. Um, but the, the, the big things that, that Frick did uh, would be things like, uh, like the Hall of Fame that he was very interested in and that he pushed. He did uh, step in very hard on the, and there was a, a story in, in one of the New York papers, um, I forget, Joe Williams, I think, was the, was the columnist who broke it, saying that there was about to be or was having a rebellion on the part of a number of St. Louis Cardinals that they were going to refuse to step on the field with Jackie Robinson. These, these guys, it was supposedly a bunch of Southerners on the Cardinals uh, who were not going to go along with this. Um, the, the people in... St. Louis denied it. Bob Bragg, for years and years, said it never really happened. Uh, it was you know some small thing blown completely out of proportion. There wasn't going to be there been some kind of disgruntled talk, but nobody had actually done anything. Um, but it it was enough that uh, Fred Sy, the Cardinals owner, went to New York to, to be concerned about it. And Frick did step in and uh, you know with some strong language about how. Uh, you know, this, this is baseball. He deserves the opportunity. If he can play, he'll stick. Um, and that, that's the only issue we're going to have here. Um, but uh, what shall I say? The, I guess it, it was not an area where he was stepping on the toes of any of the owners or getting close to stepping on the toes of many of the owners. Uh, I mean, he knew who he worked for. Um, and uh, he, he, I mean, it's, it's almost like he took a lesson from Happy Chandler that Happy did things that irritated a whole bunch of owners enough to make sure that he wasn't going to be rehired. Uh, Frick never did that. He never challenged anybody, really. Um, I mean, he, he wound up irritating some people, especially over the, uh, the Dodgers and the Giants moving to California. But uh, um, he he never uh, he he never really stood up. I guess you would say to any of the owners. How long was he commissioner? Uh, Frick was commissioner from 1951 late uh, or 52, I guess, in, until 65. His term ran out, and the owners hadn't been able to come to agreement on a successor. So he actually went into kind of a he said, all right, I will stay as long until you find somebody. And that extended his term like about another year until they could come up with uh, uh, the general Eckert. Oh, okay. Uh, 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. We have three years of effort to forgot about the unknown soldier. Yeah, a, a great line, was it? Yeah. He's the unknown soldier. Yeah. Okay. So Andy, in the spectrum of uh, commissioners, uh -huh. where, where do you put them? How did you rank with this? I guess, yeah, he'd be better than Eckert. Um, I, I mean, you know, again, uh, what do you want from a commissioner? Um, what, are, what are they supposed to do? Um, stop a strike. Stop a strike. Okay, yeah, I mean, the, the, the commissionership has evolved since Frick days to the point where I think now, really for the first time, we have a commissioner who is acting more or less as a CEO. He has a big organization behind him with MLB. He is trying to do some, some planning and thinking, um, which was all, uh, you know, Uberoth started a little bit of that in terms of, uh, he had a lot of initiatives with joint uh, marketing and sponsorship that really kind of dragged some of those issues uh, out of the hands of the individual owners who we weren't doing a very good job uh, communally anyway. Uh, but then again, when, when Uberoth tried to be activist in dealing with what the owners felt was their biggest issue, he created collusion, um, which got them in, in even more trouble. And then you had Bud come in and, um, I think we're still reassessing. I'm sorry. Oh, for a few. Yeah. Well, your mom and your Vincent, yeah. Um, but what I, that was like two or three years, I think. And then you had almost 20 years of Bud. Uh, and, uh, you know, Bud was very effective in some way. I think they're still reassessing Selig as a commissioner and what he did and what he didn't do. But uh, uh, I think he paved the way for the current setup. And uh, he, had a, he had a real talent for schmoozing you know, finding out what was possible and, and getting some of that done. So, but uh, yeah, the commissionership is, has changed. What's your opinion on no longer having presidents of the National League of American League? I think it was an irrelevant job to begin with and has become less. I mean, if, if you look what they were supposed to do, run the umpires, deal with issues regarding the schedule and deal with whatever problems came up. Do you need a president for that? I mean, Will Harridge, interesting, Will Harridge was a clerk for, for one of the railroads who proved to be very good at helping major league teams deal with their transportation issues during the railroad era. He was a, he was a terrific clerk and they made him a league president. And again, he was a terrific clerk. Uh, <laughs> that That's what the job needed. Um, and I think, you know, people like Frick were more high profile than Harridge, who really kept himself out of the spotlight. But essentially, that was the job. That and a certain amount of PR, uh, which Frick was much better at than Harridge. Um, so, I mean, it's, I think these are high profile positions. People want them to be leaders. And in fact, they're highly paid public clerks doing what the owners want. Well, also before interleague play, there was a big distinction against national, against American. Now you don't have that. It's anymore. gone, yeah. 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 Anyway. Anybody online with a question? All right, good. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Abby. Excellent as usual. Uh, plug you here and stop sharing. And uh, see what we're going to do here. Did I get lost over here? Let's see, we have a, a, 
Okay, is this a new person online, Galaxy A50? That somebody new, all right. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the 2021 season and uh, if we look at this season, that the team in the playoffs that won the least amount of games won the World Series. Okay, the, the team in the playoffs, the Braves, uh, I think they won, won 80, 87 or 86. 80, 88, was it? 88. Yeah, that they uh, won, the, won the series. That was certainly unexpected. Uh, what else? Otani, uh, we've never had, we haven't had a player like that in uh, 80 years. <laughs> well, and you look at his success compared to the previous year as well, right? Where he hit under 200 and he looked horrible to play then to come back after some monster season. It's pretty. And he was what, 91? 92? 92. 92. You know what's going on. And I, I think part of that is because the pitchers coming up through our system, they don't get even high school. A lot of them don't get college. They, more. Got, college they definitely don't get. Not anymore. I don't know. It's on little league traveling teams and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, they have to, somebody from outside who got a chance to do that. And you see some of these hitters, like, like I guess, like Kershaw and Grinky and people like that, they can hit. Um, if they had ended up the same way. Well, I think that was a big difference between 2020 and 2021, where in 2020 you had uh, designated hitters of both leagues. Right. Uh, also, all of the playoff games were played in one area, and they only played 60 games where you saw more injuries this year, especially uh, hamstrings and muscle pulls and stuff because they were playing 162 games and it made quite a difference. And the National League had the pitchers again hitting and I think that made a big difference too. I don't like designated hitters, but I think we're gonna, I think it's gonna happen. I gotta say one other thing. I gotta add, uh, I gotta add position players pitching to the list. It just seems to be an it seems to be an epidemic in 2021 that needs to be stopped. Or it, it's just a trend that's trend that's out of control. So should we bring back the registration for pitchers? What's that? Uh, once upon a time, uh, Andy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the leagues required teams to register pitchers so that position players could not pitch. Is that right? I don't recall that. I mean, okay. You, you, you pitchers pitch it semi-regularly over the years. No, I'm talking about position players pitching. They, they've tried to limit it a couple of times, but yeah. maybe, maybe, oh, maybe there was a year or two where, where you had to you had to designate which position players could pitch if you were in that emergency. But I don't, I'm not sure of that at all. It, it seems kind of weird to me to create a rule specifically when there's no problem, right? Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be the first time. No, it would not be the first time. How okay. about no pitchers hit 200 innings this year, right? So, I don't think so. Even with the full season, I think they have the lowest numbers of ERA qualifiers. I mean, yeah, I'm back with the team. Yeah, six teams did not have an ERA qualifier. If, if the trend <laughs> continues, do you lower the requirement, right? Yeah, and you don't find out. To me, the most 
most amazing thing of the year with the Giants. Yes. Okay, so Andy hit upon what I was going to talk about, which <laughs> is the Giants. Uh, but I've lost connection on one of my computers, which is where the. Uh, yeah. Do you need to pass through to the, on the phone again? How's the phone doing? I was never going to hear you. Are we holding out? I still have enough. Okay. That's all right. Hold off. Hold off here. Uh, now we're online. Oh, we're in. Okay. What I'm missing is I need to reconnect to Zoom okay. over here so I can show you my presentation. Let's see if we can do that here. We have a great year. Yeah. And then the fields, too. Yeah. 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 Okay, I can't remember the number, but there was some word about the number of players who played in the big Players from independent leagues? Wow. My league strengthened so much that they have to go to the independent leagues. So that's part of the shrinking of minor leagues uh, has led to uh, more independent league players coming up. Yeah. Oh. started in the minors. Yeah. Had a couple of years, blamed out, trying to keep his career alive by going to the independent league. Right. So, a lot of players have done that. I think there was like 47 or something. For this year, guys who came from the Do you think not only the independent leagues, but you think of the guys who are from Japan and Korea? Mm -hmm. Anything yeah. to keep a career alive. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then they come back and they, they've got a new pitch or yep. what it might be. And they, they yeah. Yeah. Has anybody read the Chris Cost biography? No. He was a, uh, a guy for the Phillies, uh, but he bounced around uh, different. Uh, independent leagues and such and, and uh, very low level and trying to get his way finally made it to the major at 33. Uh, great book talks a lot about his his career in these lower levels trying to make it and, and the things he had to do every year. Um, if you get a chance to read it, it's, I think it's about a 33 year old rookie. Chris Cost. C-O-S-T-E. Okay, well, we mentioned the Giants, and I, I wanted to talk about the Giants here, so let me, uh, let me share that, because I think this was, for me, one of the more unusual stories. Uh, how, how did this happen? How did the... Uh, how did the Giants? The Giants cheated. Yeah. They stole four hundred. No, they did not cheat. Thank you. Uh, no, the Astros cheated. <laughs> I mean, the Astros. That paid off. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. Okay. Two years ago, the last time we had a full season, right? The Giants won seventy-seven games. Yeah. Last year they had a losing season as well. Yeah. But then, you know, last year was an anomaly. Uh, 30 wins better in what is essentially successive seasons is highly unusual. So what, what changed? So serious question. Uh, I'm open to answers here. What, what, what was the difference? Well, a combination of uh, bringing in uh, seasoned players from other teams and rookies and having them work together and they seemed to hit it off right and they had some uh, very strong pitching. Uh, some new faces, yeah, and pitching. And faces also. I think they also, there's a, 
a psychological component, which we may not talk about it for in the analytics. But um, everybody thought they were full. April they pulled, May they pulled, June they pulled, no. and, the, and the players I think heard that, <laughs> and, and 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 I think they 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 felt like they were congealing more and more and more, and because I, as a Dodger fan, I every time the Dodgers would win, the Giants would win. Right. Giants would finally lose a game, the Dodgers would lose. A game. I mean, it was it was one of the most interesting pennant races or division races. Uh, Je yeah, Jeff is right. Everybody was waiting for the Giants to collapse. No. And it didn't happen until the uh, division series. Well, they didn't even collapse they, then either. It wasn't I mean, really a collapse. It wasn't for, uh, it wasn't for Chick Swing. <laughs> one home run. Well, yeah, one home run. Yeah. 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 It came down to one or two pitches. Yeah. But so still, a remarkable story. And uh, the manager, I think, had a lot to do. And and look at the, the staff, you know. Uh, what's his name? The guy they got from the Dodgers. What? No, uh, Farhan. Yeah, Zaidi. Yeah. Oh, the uh, okay, the front office. Right, and the look players. at the, and he learned from Friedman how to build a team. And okay, that's the way they did. built this team, brought in new players. Okay, so we heard a lot about new players. Okay, what what was the last team to win a hundred games and not make the playoffs? Was it 1980? It was the Giants no. in '93, right? The 93 Giants, because there was no wild card. And they, on the last day of the season, they finished a game behind the Braves. Managed by, managed by Dusty Baker. And Dusty Baker was uh, giant manager. Giant right manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As he was in 2002, uh, when he blew the World Series by bringing in a rookie reliever. Eh, you're playing against the best team in the game. <laughs> They got lucky. Debatable. <laughs> Another team that was built to win. Yeah. But not, didn't look so like that. The 93 Giants didn't make it. <laughs> Wild card resulted almost directly from this. Can we say that? Well, it was, it felt, I think a lot of people, as a Dodger fan, I remember that year because I thought, wow, we got to murder on that one. <laughs> uh, it, that, and it didn't seem to be just. Yeah, there, there was a perceived injustice here that led to that. Okay, so 2019, Bruce Bochy is retiring. It's his last season. He's extremely popular. He's extremely successful. Coast of the trade deadline, the Giants are starting to get their act together. And it looks like they're going to uh, gonna be competitive. And so the Giants have to decide, you know, are we buyers or sellers here? And they say, okay, it's Bochy's last year. Let's go for it. Let's go all in. And it's a disaster. The team collapses and uh, they, they do not, and they end up with a losing record. Everything goes just the opposite of what they were trying to do. It, it doesn't work still, but you know, Bochy was successful. Well, yeah, I thought of what three, three world championships. Three world championships, yeah. And, and look at that postseason record. Okay, so what was going, who was playing in 2019? Some of these names should look familiar. Now we have wins above replacement. Uh, as most of you know, a negative number means you shouldn't even be in the major leagues. Uh, from a zero to about three is, what you'd expect above three, three to five, three to six is all-star level. Uh, six and above is MVP talk. Okay. So Posey had for his, his career had been declining. Uh, so he had a lower than established level. This is a guy who is a career 300 hitter. Belt was just so-so. Panic was awful at second base. Crawford was in decline. Uh, Longoria had his usual good season. Was he with the Giants that year, 19? Yeah, okay. yeah. And this yeah, was I his, think uh, his midway through, it wasn't our trade uh, to might, bring him over. Okay, might have been. I don't have the numbers in front of me. But yeah, he definitely played for the Giants and was, was their third baseman more stuff, so, played more games at third than anybody else. The Giants was twice on this list. 
Uh, these names should look familiar. <laughs> the outfield, uh, Yastrzemski came up, had a good year. The outfield was okay. The reserves, uh, Sandoval was back with them that year uh, and played well, but these are okay for reserves. Solano shows promise, uh, but nothing special here. And then we get to the pitchers. Okay, the star pitchers are Samarja and Bumgarner. Uh, the rest of the starting pitching staff is dreadful. Uh, Derek Rodriguez has a bad year. Uh, and uh, Sean Anderson, uh, Drew Pomerantz, below average pitching. Supposedly, based on these numbers, could be replaced with, you know, the, the 26 man on some other roster or a top minor leaguer. Uh, they did not pitch well. And for Baumgartner, that's not such a hot season. Pitchers tend to have higher war than position players because they, up until this year, they faced a lot more batters than batters faced pitchers. That seems to be in decline. So what happened to these guys? Okay, Samarja was released. He did not pitch in the majors this year. Uh, Baumgartner was a free agent. He's a diamond bank. Uh, Beat is still with the Giants. He's in the minors, however. He had Tommy John surgery. Oh, Tommy John surgery, Andy said. Okay. Well, that'll, that'll take care. Uh, Rodriguez was a free agent. He's with the Rockies in their minor league system. Uh, Anderson was traded for Lamont Wade, who uh, is significant. Uh, he was subsequently waived three times. It is now with the Padres. Pomerantz also with the Padres via free agency. So these guys are all gone, the whole the entire starting pitching, the whole rotation out. The relief pitching, uh, Will Smith was the closer and uh, did have occasion to pitch to the Dodgers, Will Smith. Uh, decent, but nothing special here. So what happened to these guys? Okay, Will Smith is a free agent. He, was with the, with the Braves this year and doing a pretty good job. Uh, Maranto is still uh, Giants property in the minors, as is Gott. Dyson was traded. He's with the Twins. Rogers is, Tyler Rogers is the one who is still with the Giants and still in the majors and did well. Uh, Melanson, Mark Melanson was traded to the Braves. Melanson pitched well for every team except the Giants. <laughs> He was, uh, he just couldn't get his act together. He had a lot of blown saves with the Giants. But every other team he's pitched for, he's contributed. He was traded the Braves. He's now also with the Padres. So a lot of the ex-Giants with the Padres. Uh, Conrad went to the Phillies. Bearclaw, free agent. He's with the Twins. So most of these guys are gone. Okay, so what happened this year? Well, we have a new manager with a new style, Gabe Kapler, who's uh, big on pinch hitting and taking out pitchers, making a lot of in-game moves. But notice four of these five names are the same. But except for Longoria, who is roughly the same, they, they improved radically. Posey, after taking a year off, comes back to his all-star form. Uh, Belt leads the team in home runs, lives up to his name. Solano gets the second base job, shares it with Listella and a few others and contributes. Crawford has an MVP year. Crawford's WAR is 11th best in the majors, seventh best in the national league. Uh, rather remarkable. And Longoria contributes. In the outfield, all right, Dickerson wasn't so hot, but uh, the other outfielders had good seasons. But these are the same guys. So with the exception of second base, it's really the same lineup. 
but everybody improved, or more, just about everybody improved, or at least did not get worse. Here are the reserves. This is a different cast of reserves, but notice how they're all contributing, particularly Darren Ruff, who had a key home run in the uh, division series. Unfortunately, with nobody on base. <laughs> but unfortunately for the Giants. Where's that day of Mike Buckman? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't do much. He did one game. <laughs> yeah. One game when he went over the chest to pull that Pujols home run back. Uh, if, if he doesn't make that catch, the Dodgers win 107, the Giants win 136. <laughs> Well, they had good fielders. Yes, Dave. Is Chris Bryant score for the season or for the Giants? No, just for the Giants. That's pretty good. Yeah, so considering the short time he was with them, that's, that's, he made a very good contribution. Yeah, Chris Bryant, it's just for the Giants, 1.1 lore. So all these guys contributed. The trade for Wade worked out very well. He made some uh, key hits and played well on the field. So this was a strong support staff. The starting pitching, of course, we said was a complete turnover. And that was extremely successful. You know, it's interesting. I was listening to Mike from the other talk the other day about Logan Webb, that he was still in the minors in September 10th. They brought him back up. He, he went up and down this year. And yet, I thought of him as like, you know, the end zone hit him. But he had an interesting year this year, and they, they played him perfectly. Logan Webb, is, well, he still had options. Right. And what happens with options is when you're bringing a player off the uh, injured list or you want to trade somebody, you have to make room. And the way to make room is to take the one guy who has options and to send him down to the minors, even if he's playing well. Right. It's clever. I mean, it's clever. Otherwise, you lose a guy and you, you don't want to do that. So you, so you tell Logan, you know, sorry, you're going to have to spend a couple of weeks uh, in the PCL. Uh, make the best of it, and you'll be back. And I mean, he was tremendous, and, and, and especially so uh, in the postseason. But he had a very good year, uh, as, and Gaussman was sensational. Uh, I mean, this guy is what a journeyman, can we say? Or, and suddenly he's late a developer. suddenly he's a star. Yeah, he comes on late, late developer. Thank you. Uh, How many of those guys do you think next year are going to produce anywhere near it? Well, okay, so the question is, what are they going to do next year? Probably regress to the mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I bet on the the rest of them. Uh, well, do you think Alvin will continue? I, I mean, we, he's got a long track record, and that was his career year. Didn't he, didn't he have a good year last year, even though it was short? I think he's a good pitcher, but I don't know that he'll be oh, as good. Oh, I'm thinking he might be on that, like the Jamie Moyer trend where he's figuring it out. <laughs> and could have a couple of good years right now. Yeah. Um, Cueto, face. I just heard they cut him, right? Yeah, he's gone. Well, Cueto was injured much of the year. Didn't pitch very much. He started out good. But, uh, yeah, the, the he's, he's a pretty good pitcher, but uh, he's had injury problems. And but Posey retired. Posey just retired. That's yeah. another story. Uh, broke my heart. What are you going to do? Uh, the old spend more time with the family routine. Uh, but what, what it means for Posey is he's going to finish with a 302 batting average. Uh, <laughs> if he played three or four more seasons, he'd probably drop down. Down to Mickey Mantle ring. Yeah, you know, at least. Uh, cool. So he is the uh, first uh, catcher to retire with a 300 batting average, I think, since early Lombardi. Wow. Oh, really? Campanella didn't do it. Uh, certainly, Bench didn't do it. Um, oh, Piazza. Yeah, uh, excuse me. Yeah, Piazza did. Yeah, yeah Piazza was the other one. Yeah. Hall of Fame for Posey. What do we think? Yeah, but, but not first. Not first year. Maybe a Veterans Committee guy. I think his career is too short. His career award is about the same as Posada, and Posada got no votes at all. Which is strange. Right. But that was a good year. I think it was 2017. I remember the exact year, but there was a strong class. Yeah. But in Posada's defense, but still, 
historically, guys with that kind of career award have not gone into the hall. It's about 45, I think. And I, I think he had some good seasons, but not enough super seasons, right? Well, he had an MVP year. Yeah, he did. And the World Series. All those World Series. Too, Three right? World Series. The post game, I think, puts him in. Uh, the post season. So. Three World Series championships. Munson was a jerk. <laughs> People, the writers hated Munson. I would say Munson as much as, as uh, Posey, right? That's what that's the They're very even. That's the question. The Hall, of, the Hall of Fame also likes to induct people who are alive. Uh, really, they have a, a bias there. Uh, yeah, Mori Will is still alive. Yeah. Would Posey be similar to, say, Gary Carter? Would Posey be similar to Gary Carter? And no. Carter's in. Yeah. But but long longevity, 2,000 hits, right? 300 home runs. Yeah. Now, yeah. my thought of a Hall of Fame is you dominate the position for a, close to a decade mm -hmm. in your league. And no freehand should be that's a freehand, okay. But, different era or there was an offense, right? right. But Perfect. Posey has really done that. He's really been the dominant catcher in the National mm -hmm. League for 10 years. Uh, I I think the he, the problem he's gonna face is he was second fiddle defensively to Yadier definitely. Yeah, okay. He wasn't as good defensive. He was a good defensive catcher, but not like Molina. Yeah. So I think I was looking up the award after the seat retired. And if you added him and uh, uh, Yadier uh, and Posey together, they still don't equal Johnny Bench's career war. Yeah. Anyway, for whatever that's worth. Kind of, I thought so was, Bench is over 100? Bench is, yeah. Bench is on the charts. Okay. But I think Posey gets in. I think he will get in. I would agree with you, Jeff. I think Posey will be. I think will be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he has the advantage of playing catcher, right? Which is better than being a good hitting first baseman. Yes. Although he did play some first base. Well, yeah. but I mean, like a Garvey, right? Who had some great seasons, but he played first base. And and it's another guy that writers didn't like. Yeah. So I, I think they're kidding. They didn't like. Him. I think personality has something to do with it. Who did like him? Yeah, he's phony. But Garvey, the writers didn't like him. Who no. did? Who did? Like him. White people, like all the fans. <laughs> Pardon me. All, all the fans in Bakersfield. <laughs> they didn't like him either. <laughs> the groupies liked him. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so this is a big change. Uh, the relief pitching: Tyler Rogers and Cruz. Uh, solid relief pitching for these guys. There are a few others. I just listed the ones that pitch the most. But people you could rely on. A couple of Dodgers out there. It's Dodgers out there. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, I'm not familiar with Latell. Is he related to Mark Latell? Uh, back from the 70s or 80s? Uh, let's see, Littell is uh, Zach Littell. Um, you related to Mark? Mm -hmm. We can look him up. Let us know if, if, if does anybody know if Mark, if Zach Littell is related to Mark? Well, no. What I'm seeing here, Barry, is a combination of career years and what we're seeing in the relief pitching and the bottom of the rotation and the bench is we're seeing Zaidi. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. his ability to find unrecognized talent and put it on the team. Okay, yeah. so Saidi has brought in a lot of role players, uh, a lot of bench, good right. bench players, good back of the well, relief. We're, we're not seeing people coming up through the system, except Webb, and forcing themselves into important roles. So Webb, and, and Andy's he probably hasn't been there long enough to start to affect that. Yeah, Andy's saying Webb is the only one who came up through the giant system uh, in the past couple of years. And yeah, the Giants have had a habit over the years of trading away minor leaguers to bring in uh, veterans to fill in a few spots here and there to attempt to make a run for it. And that was what they did in 2019, which is why you don't see 
any, any other giants besides Webb, any other giant smaller leaguers besides Webb because they, they traded them all away. Uh, the so, other thing too is that the perception is starting pitching five and a half innings, maybe six. Rest of it's all relievers and they all do one inning or half an inning or whatever. Right. So we have to the closer, you know. The roles relievers play, pitching an inning or less, <coughs> starters coming out, uh, not not facing the lineup the third time through when traditionally uh, they do worse. Did you find anything? I couldn't find a relation. Okay. No. reference didn't, didn't listen. Different Littell. Yeah, they tell you if, yeah. if they did. So this is not the same Littell family. Okay, yeah, so we have, uh, and, and Kapler, did a lot of that. Oh yeah. He would. He had no compunction about pulling a pitcher who was pitching well after he'd been through the lineup twice, yeah. saying, you're not gonna face these guys the third time. We're not doing that. Not when we have a bunch of hot relievers who can come in for you know three or four batters each and get us to the end, to the closer. Would you say that's where the whole game is heading? Is that kind of thing? Oh, well, yeah. uh, Greg said that's where the game is heading where we have these. Yeah. Role players, specialists. Yeah. Well, not only that, uh, you know, when you see a, a starter announce, let's say Colfax or Drysdale, you're going to go see them, and you know they're going to pitch maybe the whole game. Now you see a starter listed, he might pitch one inning. Yeah, he might. Or he might pitch opener. three batters, and he's out, and then all of a sudden you have the succession of relievers. You know. So, uh, and, and a lot of teams are banking on maybe two to three starters and, and the rest is all relievers, you know? Well, that's certainly what we saw in the World Series mm -hmm. where they couldn't even come up with a good starter for game five. Uh, I mean, yeah. they had nothing. And of course, in the past, it used to be you had three pitchers and they'd pitch uh, well, then you have a team like games. the Dodgers who started the season with like seven starters <laughs> and ended up with less than one at the end that we could pitch in a game. You know, it's crazy. So, yeah, we are seeing a change in the way pitchers are handled and even the way hitters are handled with the, uh, the willingness to pinch hit throughout. Here's what I want to do. Like if we went back and somebody might have done this in the 70s and the 80s, would that, you know, would even the top range of pitchers fall off significantly when the line had turned around for the third time? So the question is, if you go back historically, when pitchers did pitch complete games in the 70s and 80s, uh, was there, uh, did, did pitchers uh, fare worse the third time through the lineup? Uh, um, I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think that has been studied. And uh, on the other hand, if you go back even further, go back to the 20s and the 30s, when pitchers were expected to pitch complete games, they did things differently. They, they held the pitch back. They didn't, they didn't throw their curveball until second and third down. They paced themselves. I mean, Grover Cleveland Alexander pitched like, I don't know how many shutouts where he gave up like nine or 10 hits because he didn't really settle down until, you know, all right, I'll just throw the ball in there. Once they get a couple of guys on base, I'll get serious. They learned to pace themselves. And that's all changed now. You know, it's, it's throw as hard as you can for as long as you can. Right? Um, it's all right, about speed. Yeah. And so why can't they go back and relearn that? And we even had a guy pitching a no-hitter removed after the fifth inning. Uh -huh. Well, the Dodgers yeah. did one with a big full spring. Was it Springer? Springer? It was spring a couple of years ago. Yeah, seven, it was seven inning against the Giants. They pulled them after seven innings. The Rich Hill. Huh? The Rich Hill, the, the perfect inning. No, it was, it was Springer. I remember well, Rich, Rich Hill, Hill, yeah, Rich Hill had the perfect game into the ninth inning or something. Yeah, against the Pirates. Yeah. Yeah, so we're seeing pitchers not allowed to finish games. 
Uh, not piling up many innings, as we mentioned. Uh, yeah, as hard as you can, as long as you can. Everything based on speed. But when we talked to the scout, the guy that was at UCLA, uh, and he said that uh, you uh, that's what they're counting. They're counting on speed, and that's it. And if you try to go into your scout director and say, "Are oh, this guy's a really good pitcher?" or then he does what you're talking about, a little this, a little that, they they say. Most scouts will want to take a chance. It's much safer to put out philosophy. Mm -hmm. And that way, if the guy fails, okay, but you play the game. Now, you put in a, a, a control specialist, a guy who has a good curveball. And if he doesn't make it, you look stupid. Right. So, Tim, Tim is saying that, let me repeat that for the, the scouts are just looking at velocity, that they're afraid to uh, put up somebody who does not throw 90 miles an hour or whatever whatever, uh, that if they bring in somebody who's just a good junk ball pitcher, uh, that he, he's not going to be, and he's not successful. I don't know what the next step is. Billy Bean is going to say, an underappreciated asset is the pitcher who can throw junk with control. I think I can get those guys really cheap. So Billy yeah. Bean will take those guys. And, 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 <laughs> I think that is an evolution that's got to happen. It's got to. It only makes sense. Right. Well, we've had we've point, had uh, right? yeah exactly. We've had some we've had some great pitchers. Stu Miller. Sure. Uh, oh God. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And uh, the Giants had a couple a guy about uh, twenty years ago who threw junk. Uh, no, Don Sutton. Even you know he's the guy that evolved. You were talking about pitchers who grow into the. Well, they, be, they were throwers when they were young, and then they become mm -hmm. right. Well, yeah. Kershaw's doing that now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Nothing but a fastball. Okay, so I think the conclusion is that we had some career years. We had some great work in the front office, and then Kapler's work. Kapler, and it's not going to happen next year. <laughs> You don't think so? <laughs> I think it's too early to tell. Interesting story. I think that's going to be a really, yeah. I'm really fascinated about what the Giants do next year. Well, I, I Joey Bard is going to be the catcher. Uh huh. Uh, he's not proven. He's he's highly regarded, but has not proven himself. Yeah, he's had some chances, really. The last two years, they hoped he was going to spring come to spring training and win that job and succeed posing. And he hasn't made it yet. Now we're getting the luck. Uh, yeah, so but you never know with minor yeah. leaguers. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, there have been some guys with tremendous promise. Uh, what, Hurricane Hazel, Brandon Wood, okay. <laughs> uh, Dallas McPherson. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you just until they actually perform, right. you can't be certain. And, and yeah, there have been some guys who have been terrific minor league players. Uh, I know Sam Miley hit over 300 in the minors, and, but uh, he couldn't throw out a base stealer. So, <laughs> okay. So, I and, could even go back further than that. How about Johnny Warehouse? Johnny Warehouse? Yeah, it's yeah. go. the same way, good in the minors, but <laughs> terrific 20 homers as a halo. Yeah. Terrific in the minors. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's not the same, and you have to prove yourself. So Bart will be given the catching job. Casale's the backup. Uh, but I don't think we can expect everybody to perform at the same level. Uh, certainly not the pitching staff. And uh, so we'll, we'll see what happens. But uh, I, I don't think we have great hopes. Oh, it's a, it's a chance for uh, Fahidi or Sorry. to uh, see what they can do another year, right? Because yeah. You're, not, well, you're losing Cueto. You're losing a couple players. you got to bring in that next batch. But what's yeah, left to trade? Watch what he does during the winter meetings. Uh -huh. yeah. He's already been at work. You know, I'm picking up guys on the waivers. Yeah, he's already been at work. I, I think he, he, last year, and he, maybe he just come in, he's going to be, he's giving his minor league system a chance to start producing. Uh, I'm sure keeping, the, keeping the fans happy with at least confident teams, if not better, like the back here. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but he's got a, and he will. I mean, he's some of the Friedman schools will be putting the emphasis on improving their minor league system, getting it going. Well, like what you said about him uh, picking up this, um, you know, role player journeyman. Uh, Wilmer Flores, I thought, was a guy I thought was like a method to the Mets. You talked about Flores? Yeah, Flores, you want, and he's a first baseman on this team? Yeah. yeah he's playing games that make some contributions. <laughs> Have to go four innings <laughs> <laughs> because he was always getting hurt. Yeah, yeah Alex, we can go four innings. Alex, can go four innings. Okay. Or is the Scott Annie birthday? I can't believe he's still around. Yeah. What's he doing here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, with the match, he was like, okay. All right. Yes. So next year, did, did the Padres finally get their act together? I mean, they were one no. of the great disappointments. No. I put money on them in Vegas last year. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't so, like a bad bet at the time. No, I was hoping that for why you're in shorts. Yeah. And yeah. Sandals, yeah. <laughs> I was hoping, hoping <laughs> the odds were good. So. But I, I, I like their nucleus. I think um, they, they got a lot of pitching last year. They were aggressive. We'll see how they do this year in the offseason. But it's they still have a chance. It's a tough division though with the Dodgers and the Giants. Well, then they're just fine. Isn't the manager gone? Yeah, Bob yeah. Is their new manager. He's yeah. a good choice, I think. Yeah, yeah they took, it's good they brought in an Bob experienced Bob. guy, not just a, another young guy that you're trying to prove. Right? Well, apparently, you know, the last guy's team there was just pals with AJ Preller, who I didn't realize all this. I heard this recently, uh -huh. and he really didn't have any experience as a, as a big as a manager. Yeah, I, I cannot believe. They didn't win that many. Did they go below 500? I think oh, they, they did. did. Yeah. 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 Like, well, like 80 or something. Like mm -hmm. okay. I, I think I, they were right at 500. Because yeah. yeah. they were like 16 games out of first yeah. play. I, I mean, I think that whole bunch has some psychological issues. I think I think happening. there was some discord in the end. Yeah. And I think they, they're going to have to get past that. Yeah. But we'll see. I think, I, I, I think they're aggressive. And we'll see what they do. Well, they had that one end, uh, their star player an injury to the shoulder. Oh, yeah. uh, I think their challenge, though, is that they're in the toughest division, right? right. That's true. Yeah. So. And you play with the imbalanced schedule, that's a disadvantage. Yeah. Okay. So I think we've exhausted uh, that subject. So uh, one more thing I want to do is uh, have a trivia contest. Uh, well, not really a contest, but ask trivia questions. Uh, any other comments on the 2021 season? I would just say this. That I, I hate, I've hated, I grew up my whole life hating the San Francisco Giants. And, <laughs> and, 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 and yet this year, I was absolutely fascinated by them. I found them almost likable. It was the weirdest thing. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, the guys, I mean, Bo Posey's not a bad human being. He just seems like, a, I mean, I, 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 you know, there's no one Marshalls to hate. Uh, <laughs> I grew up a McCovey fan. Yeah, right. Well, I kind of hated McCovey anyway just because he was so good. But And Will Clark, I detested. Oh. Jack Clark, I hated. I, they're, it's just different this year. And they were an amazing story. They really were. So. Interesting. I got they go do have it. a nice stadium. Yeah. Thank good you. So you thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Presentation. Okay. So let's take a look at postseason records versus World Series records. So let me ask a question. Yeah. Like I grew up in the World Series era where they we talked about World Series stats as one stat, playoff stats as another, right? And now it seems like when they're on TV, they're showing their their stats for the all the that's exactly what I'm looking at here. Okay. Because oh. postseason includes World Series, but it also includes all these playoffs. Yeah. And before 69, we had no playoffs. And then it was like five games at most. And now it's like 20, I think you can have 20 playoff games. Well, you've got to win a wild card. Like 15 games to win the World Series? Or yeah, it's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. But when you see a guy like Whitey Ford, his, his record is eclipsed. 
by somebody who's pitching wild card games and <laughs> yeah. division games. Well, and, and look, at, look games. at the Braves pitchers, right? Yeah. Throughout the, the 90s, so good, yeah. they're going to have monster numbers because of all the, the various series they play. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so here's our first question. And this is I, this is a really hard one. So I gave you a clue. Uh, who is the postseason leader? Minimum 35 plate appearances in on base percentage, slugging, and OPS. Same guy. Uh, not Sid or Sedano. No. Not Sedano. No. He was going to be the manager of the Mets and then he got fired. Oh, Carlos Beltran. No, it's not Beltran. It's not Beltran. Okay. Um, I'm not. <laughs> anybody, anybody on the Zoom meeting want to throw something out here? This is obscure. This is, the others are going to be easy. This is a hard one. Uh, here's our guy. Uh -huh. But look at those numbers. Uh, he never played the World Series. Uh -huh. But uh, nonetheless, this is what he has done in postseason. So he had a few good games, is what it amounts to. <laughs> he played a small number of games. I think it was in three series. That's what, about 10 games for it? Uh, yeah, maybe a little more, yeah. Or about 35 plate appearances, whatever. Three so that'd nine. be more like... Uh, Eight, nine? Yeah, maybe 10 games, yeah. yeah. Okay, which is still, I mean, it's a representative sample. Nobody else did it. Um, so he's our guy. But the rest you'll get, except for one. Uh, now, who is the World Series leader? That's got to be Bonds. Uh, indeed, it does have to be Barry Bonds. And look at those numbers. <laughs> uh, and this is just this is just I, one World Series, which he lost. I was at I went to all the games down here. And I was out in right field, and the ball, I was 10 rows up, and the ball drove my head. It was just crazy. It was just unstoppable. I got a question for you. I'm a Stratomatic fan, right? I don't know how many of you follow Stratomatic. For some reason, the Giants, towards the end of Barry Bonds' career, the card for Barry Bonds did not have his name on it. Do you know if there was some kind of a lawsuit or something? Yes. Yeah, that sounds like a legal issue. Yeah. Yes. His name was not on his. It was not on They did card. a card for him. Mm -hmm. But you can figure it out that it's Barry Bonds' card and they won't put his name or anything on it. Yeah, him. you don't own the stats, but you do own your name. Oh, funny. Yeah. I yeah, noticed this on like the 2008. Uh, so what did they say? Account? Schmuck up there or something? <laughs> <laughs> they it's blank. Up? It's blank. <laughs> yeah, you can write anything you want on it. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, well, anyway, he is the World Series leader until somebody else comes. In. Or if you raise the minimum number of plate appearances, then, then you go back to somebody else. Okay, this should be a little easier. Postseason, obviously, the, this is just counting stats. Hits, runs, total bases. Somebody who played into the 21st century. Jones. Not your pounds. Jeter? Sorry? Is it Jeter? Uh, it is. Yeah. Well done, Jason. And he played in 158 postseason games. Yeah. Because every year the Yankees were in the yeah, postseason. The yeah. At least they made the playoffs. For at least 12 years. So this is a full season. Yeah. And this is, in fact, a very typical season for Derek Jeter. This is not nothing extraordinary. This is what he did. Generally, he had about 200 hits a year. During the regular season. Scored over 100 runs. Okay. So he was just his usual self and just got into a lot of games. Okay, uh, World Series. Runs, total bases, home runs. Mal? Hey, Yogi Berra, Mickey Mal. Mickey Mal, Mickey. home runs is the clue there. Yeah. Mickey Mal. Didn't play anywhere near as many games as Jeter. Obviously, he only had 123 total bases, uh, but played in a lot of World Series in his time. No post, no other games in the postseason. He retired in 68, I think. Yeah. And uh, it's my wife, Leslie, 
Um, okay, so postseason. Now, Mantle is the World Series home run leader. Who is the postseason home run leader? I have to have more than 18. And in fact, a lot more than 18. Um, good guess. Uh, uh, Jason, go ahead and unmute yourself. Is it uh, Manny Ramirez still have that? Jason, you're on fire. Wow. <laughs> he's got his computer. <laughs> no, Jason's, he's, I'm sure he's playing fair. And well against it. it is Manny being Manny hitting home runs, uh, which is what he did uh, for a couple of teams. And uh, he is the postseason home run hitter, home run leader, whatever that's worth. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, my money's on Mantle, but uh, and here's another guy who has Hall of Fame numbers. You know, 500 home runs. Uh, but he's not in, right? Is, is he no. eligible yet? Or? Manny? He's not in, but. Uh, yeah, he's, he's been tainted by us. Yeah, it's one of those. Yeah, he was, uh, you know, he's one of the, uh, yeah. Palmero, we have the numbers. He has much better numbers than Palmero. Mm -hmm. I thought I'd say that, that, that there's certain players that group. Yeah. yeah. Was not much of a fielder. Uh, Interesting message. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, not, not particularly popular with the writers. So we'll see. But he certainly has the numbers. Fans like them. Yeah. yeah well, sure. He won games. Well, Who is the man, World man, Series? Man, man, man. Yeah. This name has come up already. World Series leader in hits. Fair. I think we all know this. Oh, okay. Yeah, it is Yogi. Okay. Again. 10 World Series. Yeah, but 71 hits compared to Jeter's 200. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're not comparing equal things here. And Jeter also played, of course, in the World Series. Who is the postseason leader in steals? And I have to give you a hint here. It is not Ricky Henderson. Postseason. Oh, Oh, I would think World Series for him. Uh, the, right. right. The shortstop for the Cardinals, Ozzy. No, it's not no. Ozzy. A better base stealer than Ozzy. Okay. Outfielder. Kenny Lofton. Kenny Lofton. Wow. Good. Wow. Look at this. Very good. Dave. So yeah, uh, thirty-four steals. In the postseason. And they weren't in that many postseason games, were they? Uh, he played for he more than one around. team. Oh, he, he was the Giants. Okay. That's right. That's it's not right. just the Indians. Yeah, yeah he's, he's been around. Uh, so he had a lot of chances. But uh, 34 steals, which is way more than anybody had in the World Series. So who is the World Series leader? And you already answered the question. Yeah, Lou Brock. Lou Brock. Lou Brock, yeah. Lou Brock is tied. With someone from way long ago. Ty Cobb. No. Not Cobb. Cobb didn't play in that many World Series. Correct. Uh, so I have to think of somebody. A long time. Hall of Famer who did play. Bonus? Not Jackie like Robinson? No. Before Robinson. Okay. Eddie Collins? Correct. Whoa. Nicely done. There we go. <laughs> 14 steals each. And yeah, I mean, these are Hall of Fame guys known for base stealing, among other things. So this is not surprising. Uh, let's talk about pitchers. Postseason ERA leader, again, 21st century great pitcher. Randy Johnson. Not Randy Johnson. Greg Maddox. Not Greg Maddox. Think of relief pitching. Because Relief pitchers have an advantage in ERA. Uh, so relievers ERA often looks better than the starters. And it, well, yeah, with a minimum of, of 30 innings. But only 30 innings. He, yeah, had, yeah. he had more than that, but he, he is now, sensational. If you, if you move a minimum up, then you'll have the starters involved. Yeah. yeah. A 30 is still a lot for any pitcher. 30 is a representative sample. Four starts, right? Yeah. You're talking about less. Well, with a reliever, it would have been 30 games for him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> less. Okay, so if he pitched 30 games, uh, you're talking, or 30 innings, maybe we're we talking about two games. runs here yeah. in that time to get that ERA. Uh, 
That one, or one of those two was against Arizona, right? <laughs> yeah, that a big yeah, one. Game yeah. Seven. yeah, yeah, there was that one. <laughs> okay, how about uh, now again, postseason whip is walks and hits per innings pitch. That'd be Rob Nen. Uh, this is this is more obscure, not as good as Rob Nen. <laughs> well, Gardner, uh, no, it says reliever. Yeah, it's oh, a reliever. reliever. Uh, uh Trevor Wilson? Not Wilson. Scamarza? Scamarza was a starter, uh, and not this good. Uh, I mean, not, not, you know, this guy was not known. He was not famous. Okay. Uh, Beck's a good guess. No, I don't think he pitched for the Rockies, did he? Uh, now I'm going to have to give this one away. Uh, oh, yeah. But again, a terrific number. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a small sample, but, uh, you know, 0.7 base runners per inning is outstanding. So if we go to the World Series, minimum 30, again, it's not a high bar, ERA and whip. Outstanding World Series pitcher. Hey, Rivera. Uh, this is a starter. Oh, starter. Who is still active. Is it Bumgarner? It is Bumgarner. Okay. And look at those numbers. <laughs> His World Series ERA is 0.25. Is it three, what, three World Series? Three World Series. Well, two. He wasn't in the uh, 20. He wasn't in the first one? No. It's not like him. <laughs> <laughs> He's what? Not likable. Oh, I thought it was. I, yeah, especially if he had the home run over into the McCovey. Go get, go get it out of your yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but you know, you're talking about basically a half, little over a half a runner per inning in World Series. Of course, that sensational last game in 2014. Right. Right. Uh, there were he would go through games, a few games where he was tremendous, mm -hmm. and he currently holds this record. If you keep the minimum that low, that'd be a record he'll hold for a while. Yeah, isn't doesn't he have a video on YouTube on how to ride an ATV or something? Yeah. Uh, wasn't that Jeff Kent? Yeah. <laughs> Kent did that too. <laughs> Kent had a motorcycle. Well, I thought Kent was uh, washing his car or something. Well, I thought he fell on a motorcycle. Yeah, Kent got hurt in the motorcycle accident, and he was specifically it was in his contract. He wasn't supposed to. Yeah. Be well, who was the one that was washing her car? Got hurt or something? Her washing his car. Yeah. So I think Kent's original story was. Something like that, and then yeah. changed. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he, had, he lied about it. Uh -huh. Big surprise. Uh, <laughs> Postseason wins. So this is the starting is pitcher. A brave. It is not a brave. You think it might. Andy be. Pettit. Andy Pettit. Andy Pettit. Well done, Dave. Wow. Nineteen postseason wins. And this guy's been talked about for Hall of Fame. He's uh -huh. borderline Hall of Fame numbers. Yeah. 200 wins, uh, solid pitcher. Lots of postseason. Yeah, of course he was on good Smoltz teams. Smoltz got in with uh, postseason numbers. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's that's the postseason. Wins in the World Series. Yeah. Okay, Ford. we all know this. Whitey Ford. Yes. Yeah. Uh, who else? But only 10. I mean, it's, you know, the numbers don't go up. Well, oh, you don't, don't stick around long enough with more to get. Yeah. Win. But to get 10 wins in the actual World Series now would be pretty hard. You don't have the dominance of one team. And how many of those were complete games? Yeah. And that, how many yeah. times do you let, stick around? And, you know, we've had pitchers taken out with four and two thirds innings and they're ahead by three runs. Yeah. yeah. And how they many, don't get the win. How many of his 10 wins were complete games? Probably, well, probably nine. In that era, probably a lot. Probably yeah. a lot. Eight or nine. Yeah. Postseason strikeouts, active pitcher. Kershaw. Clayton Kershaw. Very good, Greg. Wow. Clayton Kershaw, 207 strikeouts. Yeah. Wow. That's just, that's in the postseason. Mm -hmm. That's a huge number. Yep. Uh, more than double the next guy. Strikeouts in a World Series. Koufax? Not no. Koufax. No. Do 
was a Yankee. A Hall of Famer. Uh, Clemens. Not Ford. Clemens. Clemens is not in the Hall of Famer. Yeah. Okay. So what'd you say? Why are you for it again? For it again. Okay. Yeah. I would have thought Kopech had more because he got so many per game. Well, yeah, but not in the World Series. Four. He had that game where he had 14. That was, yeah, 50, uh, 15. I think 15 and 63, right? Yeah. But he was in three or four World Series. I just thought he would have amassed enough. Well, the one against the Twins, he, he was walking more than he was striking yeah. out. Okay. He barely made it through that game. All right. Last set of questions. Shutouts. We don't see this anymore. Hey, well, nobody finishes a game. I'll go with Kopech. You got to go back further. Oh, yeah, I go with Christy Matthews. You got to go back further. Christy Matthews. Christy Matthews. <laughs> Four shutouts in the World Series. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about postseason? Ooh. Uh, Maddox? Not Maddox. Johnson? Not Walter Johnson. Glavin. Rand, not Randy Johnson. Uh, no, it's not Glavin. The uh, Holmes. Holmes. Baumgartner? No. Holmes. No? No. Same guy. Who's Nobody pitches shut, shutouts right. anymore. Uh, wow. Because they don't finish the game. So you don't get credit for a shutout. Well, Kopex, um, shutouts, yeah. Kopex had one, I know. Yeah, but again, just like Matheson, Kopex only pitched in the World Series. Yeah. But no, but no postseason pitcher has done this. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna open it up. Any, uh, any other topics, anything anybody wants to share? Doing a research paper. Um, when I was a kid, I heard a saying. I don't know. What is it? Batting titles don't mean championships. What's the rest of the sentence? I don't know. I've heard my friend used to quote that to me all the time when we picked up Rod Carew. And so I've been looking through the baseball to oh, find out yeah. who said that. If I can attribute it. But I've so I'm doing research on. How important is a batting title compared to winning percentage, right? It isn't. Yeah. So I'm, I'm diff, going different categories, trying to see does it, what's the value, and is I mean, how does it directly relate? Because you think about it, if you're winning a batting title, you get a lot of hits typically. Uh, more hits, more runs, more wins in theory. Um, Bill James talks about the, uh, the meaninglessness of batting average compared uh -huh. compared to. OPS Slugging or, and OBP. Yeah. So you might want to look at uh, at OPS yeah. Yeah. as the real indicator. Tom, Tom Tango said on his Twitter account that the greatest, the most misleading statistic in the history of baseball is batting average. Yep. Yep. We celebrate when you think about all the great stories in baseball, there's more about batting titles than there are about OPS titles right <laughs> yeah. at the end of the season you're not tracking who's winning an ops or what have you. you're looking at that 331 right. versus 332 right. the 76 season where they finished one two three in the same game right and and that's it's definitely more of a, a big story than the ops or, or, or what have you so that's what i'm figuring i'm trying to do a paper on that but yeah. try and get the that's numbers good. but i the one thing i'm trying to find is the quote and see where that came from. And have you tried Googling it? I've tried it. I've tried that. Up. I've gone through, I've got several different books on quotes. I'm still leafing through those, looking for it, but no luck. You call Andy. He, okay. He's very well read. <laughs> he, he, uh, he may know that. Um, put it out on, are you on Saber L? I don't think I am. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll put it out there. So batting was it? What was the quote you were looking for? Batting title. Batting titles don't win championships. Batting titles yeah. do not win championships. Okay. Uh, let me put it on Sabrell, and somebody will okay. respond there. And uh, give me your number. Okay. I read where when that controversy over the check swing in the Giant game, Vince Scully had talked to Bruce Froming. 
who was an umpire for a long time. And his comment was that there's no such thing as a check swing. But it's not in the rule book. Check swing is not in the rule book. Yeah, you either, you either swing or you don't. That's right. right. That's right. That's so like if, you there's no bring your bat, if you bring your bat forward, you're swinging. You there's know? no tie at first base. Yeah. No. Well, yeah, and there's no, you know, at the angle that it crossed the plate, did it did cross the plate, did he break his wrist? Uh, well, there are guidelines as to how far forward yeah. you have to bring the bat. But, you know, the, the whole thing about the Giants and the check swing, it gets me is you had 26 previous outs to do something and, and you're blaming it on one check swing. Oh, yeah. Well, one, one right. swing. I mean, uh, one I get it, but yeah. you had your opportunities and you're crying about a check swing and you put... I, the same thing I said to Mike Trout. You can't put your destiny in the umpire's hands. Right? I thought Gabe Kaplan handled that perfectly, by the way, because that's yeah. exactly what he said. Was, this is, we didn't lose the game because of a check swing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I Saying in the sixties, it was you, you had to break your wrist for a check swing, for a swing, and instant replay shows that most of those swings really are swings. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in fact, a lot of checks, a lot of swings that are called balls, show up on instant replay as the batter really did bring yeah. his bat forward. Uh, but it was so fast. You know, instant replay showed so much, you know, checks went. Okay, good. Uh, other points, other comments? When you were talking about earlier, uh, the first game that we ever attended. And uh, I remember seven year old going to Wrigley Field to see the Angels, but I don't remember anything about it. But the first major league game I saw was in 58 at the Coliseum against the Dodgers and the Pittsburgh Pirates. And it was in June, like June 14th flag day it was Cub Scout Day. And I remember my dad and the Cub Scouts all going and my dad brought us binoculars and everybody was laughing at him because he says, you won't need your binoculars. We're going to the Coliseum, right? We'll be able to see the game. Well, when we sat out where the clock is, right? <laughs> yeah, in center field, 500 feet from home plate. And all I can remember is the parents, of, is the other father says, Mr. Perisic, can I borrow your binoculars? You know, Because the players look like little ants. Pirates won the game 12 to nothing. <laughs> And it was Don Newcomb's last game as a Dodger because two days later they traded him to Cincinnati. But uh, that's the first game I remember, and it was it was quite a day, you know. So, and it's Good neat story. because now you have reference materials and stuff. You can go back and, and see the batting order. I remember Frank Thomas hit two home runs over the screen, and there was a pitcher I forget his name. I want it. I can't remember his name exactly, but he hit a three-run homer uh, for the Pirates over the screen. Ellis know. or uh, McNeil or I, I I couldn't remember. I, I want to say uh, Pierce, but I'm not sure. Uh, this was '58, so I'm not sure who the starter was for the Pirates. Bob Friend. But, uh, it, it could have been Friend. I think it was. He was Friend. a good hit. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it was interesting because. Uh, I got to see Carl Erskine, who I didn't know, you know, and, and the first time I saw Koufax, he was still a rookie then, or not a rookie, but he was still, you know, not a starter yet. Yeah. But yeah, those are fun things to remember. I, and I remember my first game, uh, the, the details are cloudy, but the one thing I remember was bat night. <laughs> and they gave you a 31 inch yeah. bat. Where was this at? And I stayed yeah. and my dad, <laughs> was so upset by the end of the game because everybody's pounding him on the ground. Yeah. He's like, we're never going to another bat night. But 
think about it today. You would you arm thirty thousand fans with a bat, right? Um, well, did you still stop doing it? Did you still have the bat? Uh, no, I do not. I think my mom threw it away in one of our moves. But the Yankees stopped doing it because in one game, I think they started throwing the bats on the field because of some disagreement. I remember now they give you certificates where you can go get a bat on the way know. out. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Hand them out the, uh, the exits. Uh, it was poster night, I think, for some player at one game. And uh, the team was playing poorly. And that player had a bad night, and everybody was throwing the posters <laughs> onto the field. <laughs> Carl uh, Orts can actually is still alive, living up in Anderson, Indiana. He's not. He's going to be ninety-five. Carl Orts is ninety-five. Yes. Good so, for him. What was this about Carl Orts? He's still alive. He's living in Indiana. He's oh yeah, ninety-five. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He pitched the first game for the Dodgers at the Coliseum against the Giants back yeah. in '58. Tim, you remember your first game? I know I went to a gym, gym Coliseum in 58 or 59, and all I can remember is the Milwaukee Braves, because we didn't have a color, you know, who had a color TV. And uh, seeing those uniforms, it really made an impression on me. Just so bright. Yeah, with the, with the tomahawk. Yeah, and, and, and just the blue and the red, and we had decent seats, which is hard to get at the Coliseum. Um, but we were close enough to see it. I had no idea who they were. But the one that sticks out for me the most early in those days was Duke Snyder night in 1960. It was a twilight. I always look, look for your Vince Clay saying, a twilight night doubleheader. <laughs> and so it was two games and it started, I don't know, six, I guess. Uh -huh. And uh, they played the Cincinnati Reds. And uh, Duke was honored in between games. In those days, you know, they'd have pre games where Catchers would try to throw a ball from a behind home plate into a barrel at second base, or there'd be a cow milking contest. There are all these things going on all the time there, it seemed. But this was a twilight night doubleheader with the Reds. And I remember uh, Cookson was in center field. I think it was in left. I don't know yeah. where he okay, But um, that big screen kind of changed everything. Um, but I think Wally Moon hit a ball in between them and they ran together. And, and I think this was taken out from the stretcher, if I remember right, which is when I was 10. Um, and Moon went all the way around to what he thought was inside the park home run, but I think he was called out because Pinson caught the ball. Uh -huh. And I remember Moon coming all around, sliding in the home plate. But I think he was called out because of that. He had found it, he had caught it. He had caught it. And in the second game, I think uh, Snyder hit a home run. And where we were sitting way up high above the third baseline, he hit it was probably just a regular fly ball to right field. But I thought it was going through the, you know, where you said the clock was. Oh, I, thought was out. Yeah, <laughs> I thought it was going right through the air. I couldn't believe it. And uh, uh, that was that was a big run. I think in that same game, we'll maybe one other one. Um, Gil Hodges had been playing first uh -huh. and Roseboro catching and so forth. The ninth inning, Hodges caught. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Because you know, Hodges was a catcher. Mm -hmm. In the minors, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, that's um, funny. But things that could, but if I can go on just one more minute, um, what's even stronger in my memory is my first Angel game, the Major League Angel game in 61. We had tickets to three games, and Kevin McBride started all three. <laughs> and it was the Red Sox, it was the A's, and it was the Tigers. And we were right behind third base, which wasn't hard to get. I mean, they, they weren't really that um, precious, those tickets. We were right behind third base. And I remember uh, George Thomas playing third base for the Angels. And I think he threw three balls away at third base. And he had, uh, um, and I don't know if it was the same game or not, but uh, Eddie Yost, who's the Tiger game. Eddie Yost pinch hit and beat the Tigers. And I thought that was so cool because he was hitting the Tiger. Yeah, an ex Tiger. Yeah. 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 But McBride started all three and he won all three. And I just remember Wrigley Field was like a palace. Yeah. Coliseum to me was like a big, big barn. Yeah. But Wrigley Field coming in and they played a song called Angel Town. Yeah. You know, as you're, you know, it's on the radio and all that. But 
I remember coming in there and there was like one big entrance and you had uh, walkways leading from the um, clubhouses up to the dugouts. I remember Steve Bilko standing there at the bottom in this gorgeous angel uniform. And again, we didn't have color, he knew, we knew color, but there they were this uniform going out in the field. This was like, oh my God, it was holy. Yeah. It was the greatest thing. Kozuski was on that team. Uh, pound for pound, the <laughs> greatest pitcher, the first baseman <laughs> ever, Velko <laughs> and Kozuski. <laughs> and, and that was a team that uh, had five guys who had 20 bucks or more homework. Yeah. yeah. So every time I'm any of the Facebook groups, I know people mention any one of those five guys. I say, oh, yeah, he was part of it. Yeah. Or later. You remember your first game? Well, the one that I went to Washington, I needed to stay oh, in tight. I talked about that. I remember two other things about games I went to. One was my grand uncle got tickets to game five of the World Series. So I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know? And my mother said, okay but you have to go for a couple hours before he picks you up. So I didn't get off the whole day for school. The game was rained out. So I got to go again. And like, I mean, I probably, part of me probably would have wanted, well, I would have wanted to just lay down and you know, okay, we're ready to go to the game. <laughs> but it was even like in retrospect, it was even cooler because uh, you know everybody in the class knew I was going to the World Series, and I got to go back in second game. And the other game I remember was in I guess 1967, 68. Uh, my father was trying to teach me to swim, which I still don't know how to do. <laughs> so anyway, he had been happy because I tried and had some success. And he said, off the cuff, he said, I want to go to the Yankee game tonight? I'm like, yeah. And they started at 8 o'clock that day. Uh, so he goes, he parks in the South Bronx. <laughs> you can imagine doing such a thing. And the Yankees were losing like 9-2 in the sixth inning. And somehow they came back and tied it up. Game goes 13 innings. My father was a fireman. So he had to be at work at seven o'clock. And he said around 1230, he said, I mean, I don't think of this at all. And he said, well, the game's not over right next thing. We'll, we'll have to leave. And I said, I looked at him and I said, we can't leave. The game's not over. <laughs> I really believe that, like, if I left, I get struck by lightning or something. In the South Bronx, you're more likely to get struck by something else. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they might have refused to steal my father's car, it was pretty long. Oh, okay. Leslie, you remember your first game? I do. So when I was, I was in the fourth grade, this was Cleveland. Um, I got because I had straight A's, so I got some tickets to the Cleveland Indians game. So I got to go with my father and watch the Cleveland Indians play. And it was a real bonding experience because <laughs> my dad is a head of something. Always came home late. It was just, it was really nice. So I'm trying to remember who the players were. Um, 
Jeff, uh... yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm thinking and thinking, and apparently I was taken to some games before I really remember. I must have been four or five years old, I guess. But I, I, I can remember going to Dodger Stadium and looking out at that green field and being just astonished by it and the waft of cigar smoke. <laughs> That's because, what they let you smoke. No, in those days, it smelled like cigars. In any stadium, the racetrack, I mean, any after our venue smelled like cigars. Uh -huh. And I remember a couple of games. One was, uh, it must have been 64, I'm guessing, and the Angels, we saw the Angels and the Indians, uh, and, but they were playing Chavez Ravine. Uh, and, Call it Dodger Stadium, uh, uh, the the Ravine, and George Brunette was pitching oh, for, the, for the Angels. Uh -huh. And I followed his whole career. You know, he's a fascinating character. He's ageless. Correct. He went to Mexico and he had this amazing career. He was 50 or something. Yeah, right. And then I remember one game where I told my dad I really wanted to go and I bugged him and bugged him. And my dad's always working. And I told him the game started at two. I don't know why I told him that. The game started at one. It was against the 1969, it was the Mets and the Dodgers. And uh, uh, so we got there late and we got our seat, our seats were right behind the foul pole, which really irritated my father <laughs> to no end. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I remember um, Ken Singleton was playing right field for the, uh, for the Mets. And he was a rookie, I think he must've been a rookie, but there was a, a line drive West Parker hit out to right field and Singleton ran in for the ball and it hit the fence. And I remember it my dad. That sounds like Singleton. Yeah, yeah, everybody going, what was he thinking, you know? Um, <laughs> and, uh, but I did get to see Wes Parker. And that was also a game where I heard somebody cuss out Walt Alston. And I was 12. I hadn't heard all the words that that guy used. <laughs> And, and my dad kept saying, don't listen to him, he's drunk. Don't listen to him, he's drunk. But of course, I listened to every word he said. After a few years, I was using them too. Anyway, but, uh, yeah. uh, let's see. Uh, Ryan, do you want to share your first game with us? Unmute yourself, please. Yeah. I, I said, uh, I, I was thinking about, I'd be happy to, but I'd love to come off, I'd love to come off mute. Uh, I, I want to know from Leslie what it's what it's like to be being married to a baseball officer guy like Barry over here. <laughs> okay. I I I uh, I, I was uh, for my tenth birthday. Uh, uh, my parents and I got me my parents got me tickets to a Rick and Field uh, Cubs game against the Pirates, and it was uh, September twenty third of eighty nine, and the Cubs wound up winning. I'll walk up hit by Mitch Webster in in the ninth inning in the magic magic gun rule went to five. You know, you didn't I, I, that was the year I learned the Cubs hadn't won since 1908. I'm like, is something wrong? Do I need my ears clean or cleaned or I you know you, you couldn't bad than that. But uh, it was kind of strange that the Cubs were uh not associated with winning a lot of times. The first game I saw, I happened to be a huge franchise uh, win. So that's interesting. Yeah, that's good. Jason? So, you know, I can't actually remember my first game. I have vague little snippets that don't add up to one particular day. <clears throat> I mean, the best recollection I have is probably around 75 it was a dodger game and i just i have a i just remember sitting high up on the right field side and just sort of taking it all in and for some reason the only name that i remember from that is manny moda it's the only just there's this memory of hearing moda's name announced but then i think that there's also that 
little routine that somebody did later, you know, where they did the the imitate mani 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 moto moto, right? Like like you get that in your head, like maybe it's a thing that I heard later, and I I think, I think that was actually I think that was actually in uh, I think that was an airplane the the, the airplane the, the airplane movie. Yeah, there you go, there you go, good yeah. memory. So I I feel like it's one of those things that maybe I don't remember from the actual game, but it got mixed in. Um, one of the games that I have a very good memory of was in 1977. I'm pretty sure we went to an angel game and I remember Ryan pitching and he pitched a one hitter and it was a big blowout. And I've actually looked up the box score to try to refresh my memory on it. Um, and the, the thing that I remember most is there was a brawl with the A's and my memory of it, at least, is that Joe Rudy playing for the Angels hit a home run and then the A's asked to look at his bat and Rudy got furious and came out and somebody started fighting with somebody. And I've been trying. This was the first thing I actually tried to research once I got the Sabre research tools. I went back through a bunch of old sporting news to see if anybody referenced it and I didn't find it yet. So. If anybody knows that story and wants to share it, I'd love, uh, I'm, I'm gonna still keep digging. I was having trouble trying to go through the LA Times archives, trying to see if they'd written about it that day. And I was gonna look for other papers that were, that were online. Um, Cause I just, I have a feeling that there was a great story there about that if I'm remembering it right. But- What, what year was that? I think it was 77. Okay. Okay, uh, so already hitting a home run against the A's. It, I saw a fight with going, the A's and the Angels, but it was it wasn't seventy seven. Okay. Usually the A's were fighting each other. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So that's as much as I can put together from that. But yeah, we went to I got to go to a handful of Dodger games in that era, and uh, you know, it just the individual games kind of bleed together at this point. I remember my mom taking us when she was on crutches. She had ripped up her knee dancing and. She had tickets and she's like, I'm taking you to the game, even on crutches and, you know, getting up and down the stands and, um, and all that. And, you know, it's the little things you remember, like we were at the concession stand and she couldn't hold her beer and move the crutches. So she handed me the beer and, and this guy said, you can't give him the beer. And <laughs> she's like, well, what am I supposed to do? I can't hold the beer and work the crutches. And he said, you can only hand it to him when you're six feet away from the counter or something ridiculous like that. So she hopped back and forth and handed me the beer, whatever. Uh, they, they freaked out about it. But I guess that makes her a pretty good mom for taking me even on crutches. <laughs> and for buying you a beer. Yeah, yeah. To this day, you have that beer crazy. My first game was a minor league game, Pioneer League in Dirks Field which was in Salt Lake City. Uh, I remember seeing Dallas Green pitch. Whoa. But uh, that, that's, and then uh, a few years later, my first major league game was 1961 Wrigley Field, Los Angeles. Uh, Boston was in town. I saw Yastrzemski hit a home run. I think there were about five home runs that game, which is exactly. not unusual for Wrigley Field. No. <laughs> uh, Home run derby. <laughs> I think maybe even Bilko homered that day. But, uh, but okay, good. Uh, anybody have any other topics, subjects you want to bring up? Any comments? I'll ask you something as long as we're checking. So the, the, the trivia stuff on the postseason reminded me of something that um, they talked about on the Sabercast recently, and I thought was a really good discussion, which was when we evaluate Hall of Fame credentials, generally, if a player was more marginal, but it was really excellent in the postseason, they'll, they'll talk about the postseason as being the thing that could put them over the top, like a Jack Morris. But when a postseason wasn't a factor or they were not good, the voters tend not to think about it too much. And they tend to only count it in your favor. Um, and they didn't talk about it. I think he was talking to Mark Armour about it. And um, they didn't go into too many examples, but I was just curious if anyone heard that and anyone um, had any thoughts on whether or not postseason can hurt your Hall of Fame credential if you had it from good regular season stats. I was trying to think of anyone who actually might have hurt their chances because of that. 
Steve Garvey wasn't great in the World Series. He was great in the postseason, but not in the World Series. It's down the hall. What about Buckner? I don't know about his career. He's pretty decent career. Yeah. Uh, borderline. I mean, a lot of accumulation numbers. Yeah, I don't know what his career numbers look like right now. Yeah. Okay. 2,700 hitters. 285 hitters. Okay. Yeah. okay. I don't think he was a 300 hitter. No. I, yeah, Buckner is not talked about for Hall of Fame. No, no. Well, Usher's well, talking about what for one thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's a yeah. yeah. And he played for the Dodgers, too. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Back in the 70s. Broke his ankle out there in second base. Well, that was so when he was a left fielder. Yeah. In one of those early teams. And yeah. He would have been the first baseman if they hadn't moved Garvey to first. Right. Yep. And Garvey wouldn't have been moved from first to from third to first because he couldn't throw. Yeah, and that meant Say got to play play third, and then Garvey got to play first, and Buckner went to left field, and he was two with Manny Mota for a while. But he was he was fast, and he had one of the sweetest swings. Ted Williams said he was the best swing. Yeah. Well, I remember him in the '74 series. Yeah, committing errors on the base paths and yeah. running out of innings. You know, running running into an out at second he was base. A good, he was they, a good he was yeah, a but he. Uh, I swear some of those diving catches he made in the he timed it. That he could have caught it on honesty, <laughs> but he timed it so he would die. He could I swear. Die. Well, Ron Swoboda was famous for oh. turning ordinary fly balls. <laughs> 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 Great adventures. <laughs> that was that purpose. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I think I think you're right that uh, postseason matters a lot because it, it's impressions. Well, that's how I if you look at Smoltz. His regular season numbers are, I don't know that they're Hall of Fame worthy. He had a couple of good years, but World Series helped put him over. Yeah. But I can't think of a player other than Garvey off the top of my head that would be the opposite. It's mm -hmm. a good question. Well, Ted Williams didn't do much in the World Series. Uh, they didn't slow him down, though. But they did, mm -hmm. yeah, but back then they didn't have postseason. Yeah. yeah, they were only in one. But it, one it didn't World matter. Series. But, uh, yeah, I think of like a guy like maybe a, a Joey Votto who's never had a chance to have a great postseason, maybe hasn't been on the radar as much, and his his counting stats are borderline still. And but you know his his advanced metrics are great. But you kind of yeah. wonder if a guy like that, by not getting a real postseason showcase, hasn't gotten on people's radar as as great a player as he's been. And you know maybe. You know, Freddie Freeman's case gets better because he's had these couple of years in the spotlight uh, where all along he's been kind of a quiet superstar. So I do think there's something to it. I think Bill James, when he does his Hall of Fame projections, he includes all star appearances and postseason uh, accolades, yeah. awards, and things. So there is already some, some information about that. I don't know how analytical it is per se, but he does include those kinds of things. Uh, in his Hall of Fame uh, projections, baseball writers really what they uh, focus on. Yeah, but if, if Harold Baines can get in the World Series, then Joey Votto or into the Hall of Fame, Joey Votto oh, definitely gets a seat. I think Joey's yeah. <laughs> Harold Baines had room stacked for him. A bunch of White Sox guys were in there. Uh, honestly, that's what happened. The only reason why he's in there right now, and uh, I think Gil Hodges, even though the Dodgers made it to the World Series lots of times. He didn't do so on the World Series, and so many others didn't are in the Hall of Fame. Individually, I think that hurts him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gil Hodges actually had got a lot of good votes his first and second year on the ballots, and then proceeded to go downward, right. which is surprising because everybody thought, you know, you get that high, you're going to progress up. And the fact is that I don't know what, uh, I don't know why the Hall of Fame does not, uh, does not address this, but his man, his managing the mess does not count toward his whole thing case, or it's not supposed to. It, it should, yeah, definitely should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, the voters are told not to hold not to uh, not to take that into account. So that, that ought to that ought to change. Well, I got poor Mario Mendoza at Mario Mendoza. Like this is the Bay's line. Like, is this guy good enough to be better than the Ames? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Rabbit, Moranville, a few others. Well, I would, yeah, yeah. So the lowest nice. common denominator. Freddie Lansman. Yeah. The Rizzuto line. 
Got it. Yes. Sent to both of you guys, uh -huh. Terry and Chris. And he, I think Lindstrom barely made 10 years in the big leagues. Yeah. And he was never a star. Well, I was in a fantasy league based on Hall of Famers, the Status Pro League. Uh, and when Harold Baines got into the Hall of Fame, so you could, he came up for, uh, for bid, and nobody wanted him. <laughs> so everybody already had outfielders. <laughs> and no use for him. Yeah. And of course, he's got that, that kind of like stain on his name now. That he, you, know, you should have been all very good, as they say. Yep. With all those other guys. Uh, Jim Todd. Uh, Buckner. Yeah, yeah, all those guys. But you, you elevated this like, oh, well, now he's the target of our route. Yeah. My Gil Hyde is for Dick they Allen. Didn't, they didn't Dick him. Allen. They didn't, they didn't want my Maury Wells. They didn't get him because of this guy. Lou Baker. Yeah, sure. Oh, definitely. Bobby yeah. Gritch. Dale Gritch. Yeah, yeah. Trammell's in. Whitaker belongs in. Absolutely. Uh, Gritch is another one. Yeah. He's very just as good. Very yeah. great. My, uh, my user ID on Twitter is Gritch number four HOF. No. Nah. Well, we know how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> he's, yeah. he's, he's, he's the real thing. You bet. He, in an era, in that era, he was the one of a kind. He really was. Um, I, I went to Chuck Stevens' funeral uh, a few years ago. Chuck Stevens was the well known, uh, he was the head of the association. And at the, uh, at the funeral, uh, Gritch spoke. Just, down to her, both feet on the ground. Just really good guy. We invited Gritch to speak uh, to a, a Sabre meeting, uh, and his response was that he golfs on Saturdays. <laughs> <laughs> but then that could be exactly what he does. Yeah. Right. And it's uh, not like a, not like passing this off, but he's, uh, his son was uh, at UCLA for, for his uh, college career, and he came to almost every game, he and his wife. And uh, just one of the parents. It was, it was no different. It wasn't um, just, just a regular dad. It was nice. We, so I was at the back in 2011, I think it was, we had the 50th anniversary here. And every game they had a guy throw out in the first pitch and then go sign on grass out in center. And Gritch was out there one day. He didn't throw out the first pitch. He was just walking around and asked him to sign a program. I had a bunch in my bag. And he signed it, but he didn't just sign Bobby Grish. He put six time All Star and all this stuff, and just a great guy. Yeah, very down to earth. We used to have this traveling group of uh, ball players that do like charity games back in the late 70s, I guess. Yeah, Bobby Grish was traveling group. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank you. I think, uh, thank you very hopefully, we'll get Noel Hind, and uh, maybe uh, some of you guys will have some research for us uh, for our next meeting, probably in the spring, maybe in Pasadena. We'll see. And then thank you, especially Dave, for oh, you're welcome. Use of your phone <laughs> and setting all this up. Uh, that was tremendous. Well, yeah, you got 11 people on there at one time. Yeah, so that's good. Yeah, yeah. We probably chased a few away because we didn't start at 10 o'clock. Yeah, sorry. Right. But it's nice to have an in-person meeting again. Yes, it felt like it wasn't ever going to happen again for a while. So. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Good night, guys. Good singing. Yeah.